Good evening and welcome to the March 12, 2015 meeting of the Northampton School Committee. I'm Mayor David Narkowitz and I'll call the meeting to order and I'll ask the clerk to call the roll of the school committee. Ms. Lee Present. Ms. Laura Fallon. Present. 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 Here. Here. Present. Present. Excellent. Thank you. So we'll begin our meeting as we do um, each meeting with a public comment period. And uh, we ask folks who come to speak in public comment to just identify themselves and their address for the record. Um, the clerk is bringing me the list. Um, I have a, uh, I have a three-minute timer, which I will use just to keep the time. And we just ask you to try to please respect the time so that everyone has an equal opportunity to express their views. The first person who is signed up to speak is Rich Winnick. Mr. Winnick, how are you? My name is uh, Rich Winnick, and I used to um, be a librarian in the school district for 22 years. Uh, worked for your predecessors um, until I'm now retired. Um, about a year ago, um, during a conversation with um, Sarah Madden, uh, while I was volunteering at uh, Ryan Road Library, uh, I, it occurred to me that um, the four elementary libraries, uh, which were still um, using cards and pockets, the old card catalog and uh, circulation card, um, could be automated uh, with enough um, labor. Um, and what I took it upon myself to do is to, to gather uh, together some re other retired librarians that I knew uh, from the district and from other places. And they have um, been conscientiously uh, doing the initial uh, component of converting to a uh, computerized system which is evaluating the, the collections in the uh, four elementary libraries. Uh, this is a, considered a professional job, and it is being done by, by four or five, maybe even six uh, professional librarians, although we are retired. Um, it, from one of the uh, school libraries, um, these items were cleaned, and I wanted you to see them, because when you see them in the libraries, um, which might be disposed of. Um, I wanted you to know that they were materials that um, you know were no longer um, of any value. Um, <coughs> okay. The the um, the cost of computerizing libraries um, under. In normal way, in normal way, the way JFK was and the way the high school was, is approximately ten thousand dollars per library, uh, and that money is basically uh, used to acquire um, the computerized record for each and every book in the library. Um, it roughly is about seventy cents per book. You've had ten thousand books. That's seven thousand uh, dollars. Some of the libraries are, are larger. Some are, are are smaller. But in any case, it's it's quite expensive. Um, and that money came from the building committee funds when the um, when JFK and the high school were renovated. Um, in any case, what I'm hoping to do now, um, as these libraries are are being evaluated, is to acquire what are called MARC records, M-A-R-C, uh, which stands for Machine Readable Cataloging, very standardized format, computerized format that is universally used um, throughout you know, the entire country, public, private, uh, school libraries, they all, uh, if they're computerized, they use MARC records. And with the help of um, Marlene Pearson, um, who is the VINS coordinator, uh, we are in the process of gathering some people to do the, the labor of acquiring these MARC records. And I, I hope that over the next year, uh, we will be able to um, save that $10,000 per school uh, by having volunteers uh, using computers, laptops, and um, desktop computers to acquire these records and hopefully 
Uh, by this time next year, you'll have computerized libraries. That remains to be seen. It's a, it's a work in progress. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you very much for this report and for your work. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so are those books not going to in the library anymore? I mean, you, you took them out? They are currently in the library. They were pulled. Uh, and they're going back to the library? You're older than I am. So. <laughs> Did you know? Wow. The title on some of these books? <laughs> Let's weed. Because <laughs> on the titles on some of those, we should weed. Thank you very much, Mr. Winnick. The next speaker is uh, Susan Biggs. Okay, first of all, let me thank all of you for your service to this committee and the long hours that you spend trying to make Northampton Public Schools a better place for all learners. My name is Susan Biggs. I'm a Northampton taxpayer living at 711 Park Hill Road. I've been teaching for 32 years with the last 14 at Northampton High School. My daughter went through Northampton Public Schools and is presently a senior at the high school. I'm not against the concept of starting school at 8 or 8.30 instead of 7.30. But I am speaking against spending any money whatsoever on a later start time at the high school. In Superintendent Provost's entry findings presented to you on February 12th, you may recall that he found, and I quote, at every school a gap exists between the number of low-income students and students with disability achieving at the advanced level. In the elementary and middle school grades, these gaps are generally lower are generally equal to or lower than the gaps found at the statewide level. At grade 10, the gaps are much larger than the statewide averages. Learning walkthroughs were done at NHS, and I understand at other places as well, and I quote, notwithstanding the strong teaching practices that were observed, developing a repertoire of instructional strategies expansive enough to meet the needs of diverse learners is a developmental process. Recommendations included reducing the reliance upon commercially produced worksheets and using student assessment data to adjust the level of challenge for all students. I would argue that meeting the needs of our more challenged learners cannot be done properly with the large class sizes that exist in the classrooms at Northampton High School. And I don't mean the large class sizes of 28 or 30 students that have been historically existed in my AP Chemistry or Honors Chemistry class. That's okay. I'm okay with that. What I'm talking about is my freshman biology class right now that has, you might say, oh, only 23 students. But with the wide variety of needs and skill levels present in that class, I cannot meet all of their needs as effectively as I would like to. While many of our students are performing very well, our higher need students are not performing as well. And the gap is growing wider. And I would contend that this gap, the gap, is not going to get any smaller just because we start 30 minutes later. For that reason, and so many more that I do not have time for in my three minutes, I urge you not to mandate Northampton High School to start later it cannot be, if it cannot be done without added expenses. In fact, even if you were to somehow magically find an extra $90,000 or whatever extra money we determined that this earlier busing, since that's still argued about, might cost, I would urge you to spend that money that you find on more teachers and not spend it on changing the start time. In keeping with the last time that I stood before you, a few years back, I again urge you, all of you, to come to NHS and spend some time with us in the science department. We would love for you to see what we do. Many days, it's truly magical. But many days, it's so very frustrating trying to help all the students as effectively as we'd like to. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Steve Harrell. <clears throat> Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Steve Harrell. I live at 474 Elm Street. I'm going to change the first paragraph of my remarks tonight to respond to what we just heard. There are at least two studies uh, that are available to be seen on the internet uh, from reputable institutions that show that a later start time equals smaller classes. If you spend money on more buses to make the start time later, you don't have to spend as much money on so many teachers. Let me go forward now. 
I have a personal story to tell you tonight. Some of, some of you may know about this already, but if not, it's an important thing to establish. On the morning of June 3, 2013, I picked up a cup of coffee at Cooper's Corner and headed over to JFK and parked out front, out of the way, but where I had a clear view of the school buses coming and going. I heard that the buses sit idle for some period in front of JFK each day, but I wanted to find out for myself. So I sat there in my car with my stopwatch and pencil in hand and recorded the arrival and departure of each of the 10 yellow school buses over the next hour and a quarter. The first bus arrived at 7.30. By 7.38, all 10 buses had arrived. And after the students got off, the empty buses pulled around the large circular driveway right out front here and just sat there. It made me think of the covered wagons circling for the night in the Wild West. Four of the drivers got out and boarded one, one bus, apparently to enjoy a leisurely visit. One driver lit up a cigarette. By 7.55, six of those 10 buses were still just sitting there, 20 to 25 minutes after they had arrived. Four of these six had left by the time 8.10 had rolled around. The next to the last bus left at 8.13. The very last bus finally left at 8.20, fully 45 minutes after it had arrived. By that time, of course, my coffee was cold and I headed home to write up my notes, which of course I'm glad to share. I wanted to provide that background because in a few minutes, parent and attorney Renee Wetstein will try to squeeze into three short minutes a creative and money-saving plan that put the idle time of the JFK, JFK buses to good use and provide for a later high school start time. This plan was first brought forward by former principal Nancy Athis. Also, as an attorney, Renee has studied the lengthy actual busing contracts with the bus company. I humbly request that, school, that the school committee tonight consider the simple motion to allow give and take discussion with attorney Wetstein at some point after her short public comment. She has been a fountainhead of data and information on this issue for seven years, worked with many school officials, and will be glad to answer your questions on the bus plan in question as it relates to a later start time. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Harrell. Um, yeah. And <laughs> as, as previewed, the next speaker is uh, Renee Wetstein. Uh, ready to go? I'll, I'll, I'll. Okay, thank you. I'm Renee Westine. I want to respond to Ms. Biggs. She's the most amazing teacher. Two of my sons had her. My youngest just fell in love, learned so much in AP Chem. She's there every day after school, just so dedicated. Um, so I totally agree with you, and I'm glad to hear her say that she's not against school starting at 8 or 8.30, because that has been one of the um, issues, is that now it's all of a sudden 8 o'clock, and that's not the recommendation of this board that was voted 7 to 2, is not earlier than 8.30. Um, not earlier than 8 o'clock between 8 and 8.30. Um, we also, everyone that has worked really hard on this for the last almost eight years now, we don't want this to cost any money, and we believe there's a plan that actually save money. And we ask that if we do save money and find savings, it goes to the high school to deal with the issues that are at the high school, even though we're a level, fun, level one school. Um, the contract, um, I went to the city clerk's office to get the contract today. I had the one from 2008, and I was at the, um, the bid opening, but unfortunately there is no copy in the clerk's office and Joy Cook does not have a contract of the cost of the Northampton High School busing, the separate busing. But what I do have a copy of is the busing contract that we're working on now. And presently, the contract we have is a five-year contract. This is just junior high school and elementary school. It's costing us three million seven hundred and forty nine thousand eight hundred and sixty eight dollars and sixty nine cents from today we've just finished the um, 2013 to 2014 in the last year we're going to pay a hundred and twenty nine thousand seven hundred and seventeen dollars more than we are paying now just for the junior high school and just for the elementary mm -hmm. school so where when are we going to ask for those cuts and every year it keeps on going up so we have asked for the bus routes. We have asked to try to figure this out. We've asked for attendance. And I truly appreciate we finally got 
the attendance, which really showed what we have been saying for so long, and that a lot of these buses are empty. And I wanted to point out, um, and I don't think this is an intentional mistake, but last month, um, Dr. Provost presented numbers that I assume was provided by Joy Winnie. I don't know if the camera can see this, but um, when determining whether the JFK buses have room for the Northampton High School buses, um, there was a maximum count, and each um, day there was a count. So Route 6, the first day there were 17 kids, the second day there were 16 kids, the third day was 41, then it goes to 15, 18, 19, 16, 17, 14, and it never gets higher than 19. One day it's 41. I assume that was 14. That makes a huge difference. It's over 20 students that we're dealing with. So how are we going to save money? I have 20 seconds. Okay, we can, I talked to Joe Cook, we can eliminate the Northampton High School busing, the contract we have now, because that was an add-on. So that is not going to deal with anything where we're going to be sued or anything. So what could happen is that the Northampton High School students get on the same buses that now pick up JFK students. Those JFK students will sit finish, on... Finish your thought. Okay. Those JFK students... And the high school students will get off at the JFK buses right now, what Mr. Harold said, they sit there. Instead of just sitting there, two of the buses, and it could be the buses that we own, that Joy Cook and the contract shows, we could use our own buses, we don't have to bid that back out. Those buses will then go to the high school, drop the children off at the high school. High school then would start around, they have to have breakfast, it will start around 8.15, starting. But they would be dropped off closer to 8 o'clock. And then we eliminate Right now, I, th I believe we spend over $60,000 on high school busing. Again, I don't have that contract. No one seems to have that. We could save $60,000 by this plan. The, the negative is we cannot have busing pick up at the high school in Northampton at 2.30 2, 2 because they're doing the elementary school run. So you guys can decide, do we want to eliminate busing for the pickup? Because most kids, as you see, it's very empty. There's about 100 kids that take the bus home. But if you find that's a priority of yours, then they could do a pickup after the elementary school run. So it'd be close to four o'clock. That means students can have extra school help for the AP, and they could also um, do sports and activities that happen after school. So we believe we could save money. I am willing to you know, stay here if you want to ask more questions, and I'm willing to work on this. People at Smith College have offered to do this for free for us to look at this stuff. This is almost a $4 million contract, and very few people in the room doing this bidding. And so it's, it's been really kind of frustrating, but I'm hopeful that the fact that we do deal, deal with attendance, and that's been something that we've been dealing with, is that we've done with the bus pass riders instead of the true attendance. These buses are empty. And I guess the last, last point, you have to compromise on only 50 students can get on a bus at 77. So worst case scenario, we're trying to get I think you. I think you've really finished your Keep point. So yeah, okay. I think you're. But good. we got to have more than three to a seat. Okay. Three to a seat. Sometimes, if that ever happens, everyone shows up. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the next speaker who signed up is uh, Jean Hemberry. Good evening, everyone. I'm Jean Henneberry. I've had four kids that have gone through the high school. Um, my two twin boys attend the high school. They're in 10th grade. I am currently working with other parents in order to reinstitute the Northampton Mile. It was a fundraiser that took place back in 2007 to 2012. And I was on the initial committee that started that, that fundraiser. At the time, and I realized things have changed, it did not require school committee approval. It is on the agenda tonight for approval. <clears throat> and the reason why we started this fundraiser again is because when my children came back to the sports scene, no fundraising had been happening on the Northampton cross country or track and field teams. The first time that we had a fundraiser was this year, which was a treadmill marathon. Currently, our athletes do not have proper uniforms. Parents are asked to bus children to Boston, to Cape Cod, to other meets, to practices at Northfield Mountain, to practices at Hampshire um, 
college for the Amherst Invitational. And we decided that the, the need was there and that we would undertake this process. And we feel like the process has been somewhat difficult in that we haven't been given clear direction. At first I was told that we needed approval from the principal. And then I was told that we needed approval from the committee. So that's why we're here tonight and hoping that you guys can support the event and maybe even come out and cheer for the athletes because this is a really important event and it's raised over $6,000 in the past. Thank you very much for your attention. Excuse me, could you just state when the event is? I mean, since you're on oh, TV sorry. and everything. It's uh, March 21st. March 21st? Next week. And it's at the high school? Yes. Thank you. No, I'm sorry, it's downtown. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. The next speaker who signed up is Michael Hempstead. Hello, good evening. My name is Michael Hempstead. I am uh, <clears throat> a father of two children in the high school. One is a freshman who participates in the cross country uh, team and I have a daughter is a junior. And I am also a uh, director of the Northampton Mile, which uh, Jean just spoke about. It's going to be March 21st, starting on Gothic Street, ending there. It's a one mile race. We have categories for, uh, you know, the fast runners, average runners, walkers. So, so far we have um, <clears throat> over $5,000 raised, which uh, we're happy about because the, the event has not been run for the last uh, two years. So it was, um, a large undertaking. It was mostly Gene, myself, and another parent, Sean Norton, who couldn't be here tonight. We have over 30 individual sponsors and donors, um, and so you know we're tracking down uh, logos and checks and designing a T-shirt, getting police permission. Um, you know, hours and hours and hours of work, and uh, so we're really happy that it's happening. Again, you know, we hope members of the school committee can come out and participate either by uh, running or cheering on the athletes uh, or volunteering. We had um, both of our cross country teams won the Western Mass Championship this year. The indoor track boys team won the state championship for the first time. So, you know, these are uh, hardworking athletes that uh, need our support. There are a lot of needs that are, are not being met with the current funding, as Gene alluded to, um, the transportation, uniforms, et cetera. Um, but the other thing besides just promoting the event that I want to talk about is the process um, of running the event. And we, we encountered some frustrations with that, which I think is worth pointing out because I would like to um, help make this a smoother process in the future. Um, we had been told, as Gene said, that we did not need school committee approval, and then we were told that we did need it. And back in uh, January 12th, Gene had filled out the paperwork and given it to Kara Dupree who said she would uh, bring it to the business manager and, and get it through the school committee. The past meeting on February 12th, the previous school committee meeting, should have had that on the agenda, but it didn't. The day before that meeting, we were told to cease activities, stop fundraising. In fact, we were told that it was illegal for us to raise funds for the event um, because we didn't have permission to use the school logo, et cetera. So we had to stop all our activities for a week. Um, well, well, it got sorted out. Um, Carol w was helpful. She did meet with the, the business manager and, and the superintendent to discuss the event. And then we were given approval to, to go forward, continue to fundraise, because the issue is we were going to have to cancel the event if we weren't able to, uh, if we had to wait till tonight's meeting to get the approval. That would give us nine days before the event. We couldn't pick another <coughs> weekend for a number of reasons. So. Um, we did get approval from uh, Kara. Uh, she uh, called me and emailed me and said that we could go forward with the event. And um, we, uh, I'll finish up briefly, but uh, she emailed me and, and said that we, she spoke with the office and we can get a robocall for the event, which we still haven't gotten, that we could get uh, information on the marquee in front of the high school about the event, um, which we haven't gotten yet, and that we could uh, work with the coaches to promote the event. So, you know, fine, we move forward, we continue to get sponsors, uh, continue to do the work. So last night, I got an email from one of the coaches um, that, that said that he was just told that by the athletic director that the Northampton Mile has not been approved for the school committee acceptance of donation. This happens tomorrow night. 
I got an email from you last week asking to help from the coaches promoting the event. Tonight I sent out an email to the entire school system, including the school committee members, so presumably some of you got that. Um, I was then informed that the mile had not been approved and the business manager isn't happy. I would just like some better communications on all aspects like that. This is from Angus Fisher, the coach. So a couple things. First, um, we were told that we had to cease activities and we were doing something illegal by using the school's logo to, to raise funds for this event. So we stopped, okay. That got straightened out. Then we're told that we can't, that he was obviously annoyed with me that he had been asked to send out an email and then he was subsequently told that it was not authorized. So, um, you know, it, it is frustrating to put in all that work and uh, feel like the process hadn't been clear to us. Um, what's more, none of the coaches are even going to attend our event, which is disappointing because it's really benefiting their programs. Um, so, you know, I'd offered to meet the, the business manager, I understand is uh, Candace. I don't know if she's here tonight. Okay. I had offered to meet with her um, and, you know, uh, Cara Dupree to talk about the process so in the future there aren't these frustrations. I think, um, you know, having a process is great, but also understanding that people whose kids are in the school are working hard, volunteering their time, and, and to treat them in such a way that they don't feel like, um, you know, they're running some, you know, rogue event without approval and, you know, doing something illegal. Um, basically, we want to provide uniforms for our kids and busing and, and so forth. So I know I've t taken up more than my time, but anyway, thank you for hearing that. Uh, I don't mean to be so negative. I'm very happy that we have such a great program, and I appreciate all the time all of you put in. I hope some, some of you will come out to our event. Um, thank you. First. Thank you. What time is your event? Right. It starts at 1030. Um, the first heat is 1030. There are three heats. So, um, but it'll be over quick. So you. you Better get there. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. And I, and I apologize for your frustration. Okay. So that completes the list of folks who have signed up. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak? Jeremy Whalen. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you are. I'm sorry. I, I just, yeah. Yeah, sure. Sorry, Jeremy. Sorry. Uh, good evening. I'm Stephen Eldridge. Um, I am a Northampton taxpayer. I live at uh, 20 Nanotech Street in Florence. Um, I always enjoy the rich irony that I, too, pay my own salary, uh, as I am a teacher at Northampton High School. Um, I, I'm really here to talk positively about the arts as uh, briefly and effectively as I can. Um, and I've written all this stuff, but I'll probably end up um, ad-libbing it. There are a couple of positive things going on here with the arts. Um, I'm actually here. I really shouldn't be here right now. I should be over at the high school, because, of course, tonight is the opening performance of the hit Broadway musical Godspell, uh, which was directed by Kate Damon and musical directed by Bo Flahive, our wonderful musical teacher, and also Lee Thompson, NHS parent, is our TD and set design. And there's just a whole uh, large cast and a group of adults who have worked extremely hard, have battled snow days, winter flu, and I like to say complex lifestyles um, to actually put together a really dynamic show. Now, I understand that there um, has actually one of the casting choices for Godspell has seemed to have spurred uh, some community dialogue um, uh, as evidence on the front page of the Gazette. And I, I'm fascinated by that. Um, I, every year, of course, we, we, we have some kind of a casting controversy, at least among the students for every show. Um, I am reminded that uh, it is Shakespeare himself who tells us that the purpose of theater is to hold as twere the mirror up to nature to show virtue her own feature, scorn her own image, and uh, the very age and body of the time, his form and pressure. Uh, so I think it's marvelous if uh, our theater production does, in fact, uh, spur some dialogue in the community. I think that's what theater is meant to do, to, to promote conversation. Um, and in that uh, light, I'd like to also mention another upcoming arts event. And, and what Jeremy just had me, we, we didn't have enough time to make many of them. We just had the meeting to confirm all of this. It's called Arts Night Out. And uh, it's in the vein of, I'm sorry, Arts Night In. We have Arts Night Out already in Northampton. <laughs> what we're doing here at the high school is our Arts Night In. It's the first annual Arts Night In, Friday, April 10th, everybody, 6 to 8 p.m. 
Uh, we are inviting the entire community of Northampton to come to the high school. There are going to be demonstrations, presentations uh, from every element of arts and technology, from woodworking, culinary arts, theater, music, and film. Um, it's really going to be a pretty cool event, and we're very excited about it. Um, and we're just beginning to get the word out now. I am inviting, I am inviting everyone here, of course, to come see Godspell. Uh, and I have lots of flyers here given to me by the producer to share with all of you. And uh, unfortunately, only one copy of Arts Night In, but we'll work on that one. Um, and I decided, you know, we're all pretty grumpy about all this possibility, once again, of arts cuts. So I'm, I'm, I'm sticking with the positive. Um, I'll just say the one thing, which is that this is our first annual celebration of arts and education. And, and just say that I hope it ain't the last one. And thank you all very much. Thank you. And I, um, I have these for anyone who wants them. Thank you. Jeremy Whelan. Yeah, that's a good plan. Hi, everyone. I'm Jeremy Whalen. I live at 214 Pomeroy Lane in Amherst, uh, but I am the technology teacher at the high school. Uh, I am here again. I don't want to be redundant from things I said uh, last week, but uh, we were talking uh, kind of vaguely about the uh, the opinions of teachers uh, in the high school. So what I would like to present to you is, uh, and again, before I do say, say this, I'd like to thank you guys, and I would also like to thank uh, the individuals that are um, looking at this, uh, the late start, uh, for the betterment of our students. Again, I, I can't stress it enough, we're all here uh, for the betterment of the students, and it, it really speaks volumes about Northampton and the community in which we live, that everybody wants, to, wants uh, what's best for our students and to, to see that. Uh, so when I, uh, I want to uh, give to you for public record a petition that we had specifically addressing uh, school late start with the condition of budget cuts. Uh, we actually, uh, Sue Crago and I uh, were able to collect, we, we started a petition yesterday uh, and we were able to collect uh, 49 signatures from gu guidance counselors, teachers, ESPs, um, front office workers. Uh, those individuals that are uh, with the uh, students and our, our children uh, throughout the day and really can see what, what these impacts $90,000 would have. Uh, so uh, right now this is uh, in this printed version there's 49 signatures. It is at up to today 52 uh, and, and still going. Again this is within the, the last 24 hours so I think it speaks volumes to uh, how much uh, the 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 vocal um, the vocalness of our our staff uh, and faculty at the the high school. Uh, so I I will pass that out. Um, and uh, aside from that, again, just to end on a positive note, uh, I just wanted to say that the robotics team uh, was in competition last weekend. Uh, they did phenomenal. There was a lot of hurdles that they had to overcome. Uh, there was a motor that uh, blew out, but ultimately. Uh, through some of the teamwork that they have and camaraderie with other teams. They were chosen to be on a three-team alliance for the playoffs and, and finished in sixth place in districts. Uh, and the amount of time and effort that those students put in, uh, like I said, it's, it's six days a week for six weeks, uh, three hours at a time. So it's, 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 it's uh, uh, as U.S. First, the organization that runs it, says they will be prepared now with hands-on experience to go into college uh, I, at least a year ahead of the game. So uh, I, give, I give them uh, all the props in the world for that. Um, so yeah, like I said, uh, I, I, will, I will give this to you for public record. It's 49 signatures, uh, specifically addressing a late start with the budget cuts as, as we see now. I think that what we've seen is the scientific evidence, we're all in consensus uh, that uh, school late, the school start time is something that uh, should be considered, but in the, in the, with the budget cuts, uh, we can, it's not feasible for, for now. Okay. I have five copies, but I'll, I'll, I'll yes. Okay. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak during the public comment period? Okay. Um, hearing none, before we went to announcements, uh, the superintendent has asked me if he could make an announcement. So if uh, I'll, I'll yield to him if that's okay. Thank you. This actually is a comment for Jeremy and along the lines of wanting to end on a positive note. I did not know you were going to be here today, um, but you know that I shared with you my personal 
comments of thanks for the cover of the soon to be unveiled budget book. Um, since you're here, I'd like to thank you for that publicly and I'm sure you'll be playing this for your students tomorrow. <laughs> so thank you. Okay, are there announcements from the school committee? I have some announcements. Certainly, yes, um, Ms. Fallon. So it's it's busy week um, in the schools. I just want to say, um, Last night was the JFK Middle School Band Concert. Um, I was impressed, as always, by the students and their fearless leader, Claire Ann Williams. Um, they've already mentioned Godspell opens tonight at the high school. Their show is tomorrow night at 7 p.m., um, a 2, um, two o'clock matinee on Saturday, and another show at 7 p.m. Um, Saturday night. Tomorrow morning at 9.30 um, a.m. in the Jackson Street School gym is the spring concert. All are welcome to attend. This Sunday, March 15th, from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. is the annual JFK Antique Show. Um, there's baked goods, soup, and chili available for purchase, and all proceeds go to support the JFK school um, after-school program. And then finally, um, Wednesday, March 25th, is the 15th annual Northampton Education Foundation Adult Spelling Bee. It's at 6 p.m. at JFK. There is still space available for teams of three spellers, and all are welcome to attend. Um, proceeds from the B support the small grants for teachers program. Ms. Duvall. In that same vein, and thank you very much for doing that, Ms. Bellin, um, I would like to once again just bring up the Northampton Mile, um, just publicly, publicly. It's at March 21st at 1030, and there's small individual heats, so everybody please come and support them downtown. Thank you. Any other announcements from the school committee? Okay, hearing none, I will now move on to the uh, recommended actions portion of the agenda. We do have a consent agenda to be voted on this evening. This includes the approval of minutes, budget and property subcommittee, February 19th, superintendent evaluation team, February 25th, negotiating subcommittee, March 5th, and budget and property subcommittee, March 5th. There are also uh, three field trip requests the NHS Model UN Club, uh, Model UN Conference, Dartmouth College, Hanover, New Hampshire, April 10th through the 12th. Girls Lacrosse going to Brattleboro High School in Brattleboro, Vermont, April 22nd. And Boys Lacrosse going to Brattleboro High School, Brattleboro, Vermont, May 8th, 2015. Move to approve. Consent agenda is presented. Second. Okay. All those in favor of approving the consent agenda, please say aye. 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 Any absten Any opposition? Any abstentions? Okay, so that is approved unanimously. Um, I note that our student representatives are not present tonight, um, so I assume they're probably enjoying Godspell opening night. Um, so, uh, so we'll move right into the first order of business, and this is a required vote on a gift from NHS Cross Country Track and Field from their boosters, uh, and this involves the aforementioned Northampton Mile event uh, and stipulating that all proceeds would go to the Cross Country and Track and Field event, uh, departments, or teams, I should say. This is one, there'll be several that you'll have before you tonight as we begin to talk about lately, where we're asking the school committee to indicate before the fundraising has, has happened that you will accept the proceeds of the fundraising so that the fundraising effort doesn't happen without knowing that, that we will accept the proceeds. So the Northampton Mile that's been referred to tonight is the first one on the agenda. We're asking that you accept the proceeds that come from that event to go towards our, track, our uh, cross country teams. Okay. Is there... Um I move to... Um accept the proceeds of the fundraising in advance of the actual fundraising event for the um, Northampton Mile event. Okay. Is there a second? Second. <coughs> okay. Is there any discussion or questions about this particular motion? I just wanted to say, um, in response to the man that came up and talked, I understand that sometimes the process is frustrating and Sometimes we don't know how frustrating it is and, and the shortcomings of it until we actually are confronted with it. Um, we've just recently in, in um, the rules and policy had a gift um, policy that we looked at and we're, we are looking at again and so that should make the process easier. And I do apologize very much for the frustration and I think that it just shows that, you know, one, maybe we should look at the procedure so that we have something for everybody to pass out. So I just wanted to say, you know, express my apologies and, and also say that we are, we are addressing this, the gifts, so. Okay. 
Any other uh, questions or comments? Mr. Moore. Sure, yeah. Controversy side, I think I've run, I ran in that race a couple of times. And it's a very fun race. It's, uh, it's short, and, um, it's, uh, and it's, a, it's a pretty eclectic group of runners who come to it. Not the, not the usual sort of um, you know, 5K group or whatever. It's, it's a very fun race, and so I, I, I encourage people to run in it. And I plan to vote for, to accept the proceeds. And I just wanted to thank all of the parents that, that go for any of the clubs and support <coughs> all of the teams. Thank you very much for the effort that you put forth. Thank you. Okay. Oh, Mrs. Minnick, I'm sorry. I just think it would be important to point out that, that we are looking at our policy on gifts to, to the school, to the district, to the schools. But I think this particular part of the problem here, part of this issue arose um, because of a, a changes in administration over a course of a number of years and probably an unevenness in the oversight of certain things. I think that we are right now um, on a mission, I believe our new business manager is on a mission to make sure that everything is organized, everything is going by the book, everything is following the rules. And so again, I too apologize that you all ran into some roadblocks there, but I think it's, I hope you uh, were sincere in what you said, that you're, you're working with us to try and make this process smoother for the future, and I hope that it will be, but it also will be more transparent, more straightforward, and I hope going forward that our building administrators as well as our central office administrators will be ever so much more aware of what the procedures are so that they can advise people where to go and what to do and how to do it and by when to do it. So thank you for your patience and cooperation with the many changes. Okay, so there's been a motion made and seconded to accept uh, these, um, the, <coughs> these proceeds. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any, ex any abstentions? Okay, so that, that uh, gift is gratefully accepted. We have another required vote. This is a <coughs> gift uh, from the baseball boosters, and this is for a coaching stipend. And uh, <coughs> I'll turn to Ms. Walsdick. Okay. The baseball boosters have, for the last couple of years, donated the cost of a freshman coach so that we can have a freshman baseball team at the high school. So they would like to continue that this year and make a donation of $1,000 towards the cost of the freshman baseball coach. Okay. Any questions about this particular item? Okay, so could I get them? Move to uh, approve the $1,000 baseball boosters for the coaching stipend. Okay. Is there a second? Okay. Second. Okay. okay, so yes. I do have a question. I was wondering if either the business manager or the superintendent could weigh in on this. I think there, I think this had there, there were some controversy okay. surrounding sure. it. I'd just like to know, particularly as it's a uh, personnel position. I realize a stipend is different than actual um, full-time equivalent Wage. employment, but yeah. could Sure. Yeah. Could Happily. Me? <laughs> yes. So I really think this is a, another iteration of some of the issues that the boosters ran into with respect to cross-country. One of the problems that I noted when I gave the first few budget last month is that the athletic department budget in no way approximates the real costs of running an athletic program and so boosters had been called upon over the years to do a number of things um, in order to keep programs running without any kind of a procedure in place and one of the uh, one of the things that happened with the, the freshman baseball coach position is the bo boosters came forward with an offer for a two thousand dollar stipend for a freshman baseball coach. Now the problem is there's no rate approved in the contract for a freshman baseball coach. Um, and so in fact the only, the only posi freshman position that's in the contract is a uh, ninth grade uh, co-ed basketball coach. And so the general rule of thumb is when an item is not represented in the contract, or as they say, the contract is silent on an issue, that you look to past practice. So the past practice in the six months I've been here for all the rest of the freshman coaches who don't have positions that are in the budget but who have run teams uh, with funding from booster groups is that we've paid them $1,000.
Um, so I said, in the absence of anything else, $1,000 must be our rate for freshman coaches because it's what we're paying everybody else. Um, so the uh, recommendation I made to Ms. Dupree was we can accept the money, but I can't authorize payment of a rate that's not in the contract and that doesn't have a past practice to support it. Um, so um, that was the that was where we had left it at the time of sort of first discussion of tonight's agenda. Since that time, I sort of re-looked at the contract um, and tried to creatively work with Ms. Dupree in order to um, ensure that we have a freshman baseball coach. One of the things that I noticed which is recognized in the contract is a position for a um, conditioning club coach. And so I asked um, Kara if we could somehow work with the prospective candidate to expand the scope of the position to include not only coaching the freshman baseball team, but also running a conditioning clinic which would be open both to baseball players and non-baseball players. And then I think I could feel that we were within our rights as a committee to pay the, the negotiated rate of the $835 for the, the conditioning clinic plus the $1,000 which I think is past practice for the coaching. Um, so one of the things, I mean I guess sort of the <coughs> The short, the long and the short of it is there are many practices that don't have, have never been memorialized or reduced to writing anywhere in procedures or in contracts. My um, goal always is to not um, authorize activities that have not been approved by the committee. Um, and so that puts me in the position sometimes of saying to people who were used to doing practices um, because it was the only way that we could run a sports program, wait, um, let's, let's try to put some practices in place that can be argued to at least be in conformity with the contract if not actually in conformity with the contract. Mr. Zahowski. So um, I understand that when um, the athletic department was looking for a, a freshman baseball coach and had identified a candidate to fill that position. But at the time of discussion, there was a stipend amount of $2,000, if I'm not mistaken. And so in the initial dialogue, um, the gentleman uh, was expecting to be compensated for the $2,000 amount. And because of the, the past practice and what the superintendent said in regards to most, most of our freshman coaches receiving a thousand dollars stipend. Um, that information was conveyed back to um, the freshman baseball coach and, and at that time it again you know it, 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 it created a, a much longer or, you know a different discussion mm -hmm. having thought that you were going to earn a certain amount and then now a less amount. Um, so what I would like to do, uh, as the superintendent mentioned, was to um, amend the, the vote on the gift for baseball boosters, increasing that number from 1,000 to 1,835 to include that uh, conditioning portion and try to secure the baseball coach uh, for the ninth grade team with him doing that added work of the conditioning for all students at the high school. Would that be a different vote, though? No, it's I mean, an amendment. It's it's an amendment to the original. <coughs> but we're also adding a whole other position. The position's already in the contract. Yeah. No, the, the condition is being discussed. There's a, I mean, for him to be doing that too. Has he already said yes to that? I mean, I'm just thinking that we're making a, con a contract. Why not make two different contracts for it? One with the 835 and, and authorize that. And then my other question would be to follow up with what Mr. Zahowski was saying is. How many years in the past did they get the 2000? And um, I mean, and I would agree, why did it all of a sudden drop down if it had been being paid in the past? Who let that happen? No, no, no. It, if he thought he was going to get it. I think it. what the superintendent was saying was that they were offering 2000. What I'm talking about is Mr. Zakowski, what, what Ed just said. He had said that in the past that it was 2000 and now it has changed. So that's what I'm referring to as to, so what is he to said when. Is that he thought that their negotiation 
recently was for 2000 yeah. and, and following this they Correct. were saying right so i understand that but it based on past was it well i, well, I don't think anybody has it. ever said what it was yeah, in the past or if we even had one in the past question. before we discuss this i'd like to second the amendment okay <laughs> so the motion's been the amendment's been made and seconded thank you mr moore i appreciate that so you have a question <laughs> yes mr. i do mr zahowski yes. what did you say about the 2000 had it been paid in the past or is this it, just what they was, were negotiating it was my recollection from past years and i believe last year and Ms. dupre might be able to speak to this better um, but they had two freshman coaches last year that were helping out and i believe the boosters uh paid out two thousand dollars i i I don't like to recognize Thank Mr. Pree if we could. Is there a mo Can I have a So motion? moved. Second. Our motion All to speak. recognize Mr. Excellent. Pree. So you don't with exist. The, um, with the baseball position and with a lot of our freshman positions has been that if a booster club has had the funds, then they've been able to make the decision about whatever that position was going to be paid. And so the booster club, the parent representatives, and the, and the, um, the coaches would make the decision about whatever, what that stipend was going to look like. Um, last year, we had two young men who were um, recent college graduates who were working with the team and each of them, because of their experience, received $1,500. So the position total was $3,000. Um, but in years past, it has been, it sort of fluctuated depending on the experience of the freshman coach who's been brought on board. So I, I believe um, Mark Baldwin shared with me that when they first had the freshman coach in 2006, um, that it was a $1,200 position because that's what the booster club could actually afford to pay for them. And then it has changed depending on how long a coach has stayed with them or how much experience they've had, which I think speaks to some of the issues that we're, we're trying to iron out here is that if a booster club is very successful, they had been making the decision about what a coach could make, uh, could, what they would be paying a coach. Um, and if they weren't as successful, then they, then they paid what sort of what they could pay. And this opportunity is to sort of streamline the process and make sure everybody's on the same playing field and not allow a booster club to be determining the, the pay of a, of a coach. Okay, so you're new this year. Yes. Right. Okay, great. So, so part of this is now coming to streamline based on seeing that there was a problem in the past. Is that why it's now coming down? Because it, it's coming to us as a thousand. It's a lot of misunderstanding and Mr. Zakowski was the only one that knew that it was actually a two thousand dollar position previously. So you're talking to us historically as far as what it has been, and are there ev any other anomalies within the other freshman clubs? So the baseball position is, was, is the oldest freshman position that we, that we have in the athletic department. And so they were sort of paving the way, I guess you could say, for the freshman positions. Um, and so Mark Baldwin made the decision, because it was his booster club in conjunction with his parent, uh, parent leaders, what the, uh, the coaches could what they would be paying the coaches. With other positions that have come on board in the last few years, um, girls freshman soccer, boys freshman soccer, um, girls basketball, um, those positions, people started just giving them $1,000 because that's what their booster club could afford. So there hasn't really been a, a process or a consistency around what people were getting paid. It was basically, let's give them something because they're doing such a wonderful job or they're committing so much time, but we can't really give them much more. I have a follow-up question on sure. that. Um, for going back to the conditioning club, our clinic, do we have something like that going right now? Is there somebody who's done it for $835, do you know of? No. Or not, when they have not last? That I, not that I know of, no. I, and you don't know of when? Does anybody on the board, Lisa, Ms. Minnick, 21 years on the board? I've never heard of it before. I have neither There's either. There's a lot of stuff going on that we haven't heard about, and that's the whole point. <clears throat> I understand that. So there are quite a few positions in the contract that we don't currently fill because of need or interest, et cetera. So I think we were trying to work within what the contract was offering us, recognizing that we would like to acknowledge what the candidate had originally intent, uh, expected for the position, um, but adding um, responsibilities to it to sort of, um, I guess, honor that decision. Okay. It sounds to me kind of um, backdoor is, is what it kind of sounds like to me. I mean, in order to, to create, the, we're taking, getting a conditioning club, which we didn't have in the past. I mean, maybe we could have had, but we didn't have in the past, and we're creating it to honor this contract that they want to pay more, as opposed to just making it flat out fair, a thousand dollars for the position. Um, you know, I mean, to add another eight thirty-five to a club that we're not using net, that nobody's using now, he would have to make the club and get it all going and all of that. Um, 
it just seems very backdoor to me. It, do, it doesn't seem transparent. It doesn't well, seem like this is what we're, we're discussing doing. it in an open meeting. I understand uh, on that. Television, so I don't really think it's a backdoor. <laughs> we're well, talking you know what, about it openly. Eight hundred and thirty-five dollars so. for a clinic that we're not using. To me, that's what it seems. Well, I think Mr. there'd Mayor. be an expectation that the gentleman would begin the conditioning. I can speak. I understand a, that. I can speak as a high school uh, varsity coach in the need for conditioning for young men and women in it. I think uh, it's, it's unfortunate Agreed. that if we did have it in our contract uh, for a paid position that no one has been running a conditioning mm -hmm. program because it adds value to athletics and just overall health and well-being for totally any student agree. who would want to participate. So I'm actually excited that we've identified a candidate that would be willing to offer it to students because as of right now, no student is able to take advantage of a program because it doesn't exist. Exactly. That's not my problem. My point. My point is, why are we piggybacking them? Why not make a freshman and have that exist, and have another contract for the 835, and have that exist? And if it's the same person, it's the same person. Not saying anything about that at all. And I totally agree that sports and and conditioning is is important for everybody, if not just for your your mind, for you know sure. to build up your your academic mind. But the thing is, why are we putting them together? That's what I don't understand. Because in the in the future, it seems like we'll have to take them back apart. So other members have asked to, to speak on this, so mm -hmm. I recognize some other members. Okay. Ms. Fallon. I was just going to say, do you have any sort of range or comparison? This just seems like an absurdly low amount of money to pay, period. I mean, to someone, it's a lot of hours and time that they're spending. Do we have any idea what, what everybody else is paying for this? I mean, if the boosters are willing to pay more and you have someone who is qualified, I'm, I'm struggling with... So, with not um, just paying them. So, who would you like to answer that question, Mr. Superintendent, or uh, who, the, whoever knows the answer? Sure. The well, I'll I'll speak to the part about why is it an issue if the boosters can raise money? Because I think that's one thing that's important for everyone to understand. All this money we're talking about spending really is not the district's money; it's the boosters' money, which will be gifted to the district to pay for the position. The reason it becomes an issue, though, is right now. Well, all positions have a rate that's specified either in a master contract or in individual contracts. The freshman coaches right now are not recognized in the contract, so there's no way for me to uh, appropriately identify the salary. What's been happening in the past, as Kara just explained, is boosters have been setting the salary for school committee employees based on what they raise. Um, that's that's the reason why um, paying, you know, more if they can raise more is, is an issue. I'm not. No, I just meant, are we paying raise? less than the, than normal than other school districts are for freshman coaches? Is kind of where I'm. Yeah. We, where I'm saying. Like, I don't. In the absence of other numbers, do we do we have anything to compare it to? Currently, um, your coach. Well, I'm sorry. So, so my my question would be, and I only have. Um, my my son's baseball experience last year playing on the ninth grade team i know they had a reduced schedule as far as games that they played compared to the regular miaa schedule that the junior varsity and varsity <coughs> did it is largely oh, i'm sorry no so so I, I think maybe they played 12 or 14 games compared to the 18 or 20. so th there's certainly a reduced workload and so I'm not sure what the stipend positions are for junior varsity and varsity, but I would say that the ninth grade uh, team plays less contests, and therefore, um, you know, if you're looking at it for hours put in, which we as any varsity, junior varsity, or volunteer coach knows, no one does it for the, the money. They do it because they enjoy working with young men and young women. Um, but if you were to look at it, and I think your question was about the compensation piece, I think that the ninth grade coach puts in less hours and less practice and in contests. <laughs> so I mean, if you're looking at it as far as how, how many hours worked, I think they have a reduced schedule, and therefore it might warrant a, a lesser pay. If that makes any sense. Do we Right. I just, yeah, I didn't mean as much a comparison between the, the freshman coach versus JV and varsity so much as other freshmen. Do you have any information on what other districts? No, but I can get that information for you. It okay. just seems like a good place to start if we don't have any idea. Okay. Ms. Hanna? And I then guess my question Hannah. is um, if the booster club every year is gifting the money to the school committee and then we're actually cutting the check to the coach, can't we go back in our records and determine what what 
coaches have been paid in the past to have to find to try to get some type of understanding of what the history has been in terms of paying, and then we can understand, you know, better what they should be paid instead of trying to say, oh, we offered you two thousand dollars and. Now the school committee is taking it back, and so we're going to try and give you more work to do so that we can pay you $1,800 versus the 2000 you were offered. We could have some, at least we could go back and have to say, this is what we always pay freshman coaches. Okay. Or have, um, um, do you want to respond to that? Or? Uh, if I could. I just want you to know we attempted to do that analysis, and we did go back, I think, maybe six years on what the freshman baseball coach is paid. And, it's really hard to find any kind of a pattern. You know, it ranges roughly between $1,500 and $3,000. Sometimes it was split between two people. Sometimes it was one person who did it. Um, and, and like I said, none of it was reflected in the contract anywhere. So then, you know, when I'm faced with authorizing payment for an individual, all I can go by is what are the rest of the freshman coaches being paid this year? All of them, as um, Kara has said, this year have been paid $1,000. That may be based on the fact that those booster clubs can only afford $1,000, but at least it provides a consistent um, pattern that we can say everyone is being treated equitably. You know, some of the, and, and some of the um, some of those years within that sequence, I believe we had some freshman coaches who were making more than JV coaches, which is problematic. Um, I'm, the rate can be anything. I just would like the rate to be written down in the contract so I know what to pay people. Do we, um, Mrs. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Do we know what other, um, like in past years, what other freshman coaches have made in other sports? I did not do that. Well, Mrs. Vick. Bingo. <laughs> <laughs> we need a policy. We, uh, we do. I, I mean, there is a, first of all, the, this discussion, just like the previous discussion about donation of funds for something, um, is, a, is a cumulative result of inconsistent oversight and lax administration. I'm sorry to say these things because I hold myself responsible to some extent, and I, I clearly there were some administrators who were um, allowing something to, to go on that probably had <coughs> been going on for a long time and nobody stopped to consider that it maybe wasn't actually by the book. We're now looking at how do we formalize some of this stuff and one of the things that needs to happen right now is we need to look at our employment contract with our units and most of the stipends fall in the unit A contract. We need to, I, I mean I guess, I, I'm, I hate to suggest it but it's one of those things that's that needs, if this is an issue, we actually have to do this. There are a list of stipended positions there for clubs that aren't, but that aren't being utilized right now. But if there, somebody signed up and we decided to have all of those clubs, the district would be responsible for paying the stipends for all those people. And we, we should be very grateful to the boosters who have been subsidizing that, but we are we have to the superintendent's point we have not been funding athletics at the rate that it should have been a lot of other people are picking up the slack and and i'm very grateful them to them for doing it but it's all happening kind of willy-nilly and it needs to be formalized it needs to be organized and we need to have some control over the positions that exist and how how they are compensated so that there is equity among positions, that there is somebody looking at whether they are paying something similar to other districts. But I dare say that if we were to, to field all of the clubs and, and extracurricular activities that are listed with stipended positions in our contract, we'd be cutting something else mm -hmm. in order to be able to afford it, unless the booster clubs and other organizations are are paying it. so this is a this is kind of a big mess that I'm sorry it's fallen on our superintendent but I really appreciate the the openness and honesty with which he's brought it to us this he and the and the business manager are really looking at past at things that have been going on in the past and that maybe weren't done up to snuff and they're trying to Organize it, but it's going to take us a little while to work through it. I think. So I have Miss Fallon, and then I have oh, and Miss Nykerchuk. 
I just want to play the new person card. So I think part of what I wasn't understanding is does each individual sport have its own separate booster? Everywhere else I've been, there's been one booster club yes. that raised money for all. So that's why there's no consensus. Yeah. There's now both. I get it. Yep. There's, also, yeah. there's also one, and then there's one for each sport. Okay, yeah. so so I think that's what I was missing. Like it didn't make sense to me why. Like spread the confusion well, around. Yeah. Yeah. So okay. Not, don't have just one. Most schools so, have it. Ms. Nykercheck is recognized. Thank you. Um, to throw another curveball, so to speak, in this discussion, my recollection of the budget conversation that we had with Dr. Provost last week or last month included talk about not being able to fund freshman programs. And if the boosters are paying for the coaches, who's paying for the rest of the freshman programs? And is that something that we can Yes, go ahead. In the budget that you'll receive tonight, and also in the first view budget that I presented last night, the cost of freshman sports ex that exceed the cost of the coach were in there. So uh, the official fees, field fees, transportation, um, all of that um, is in the athletic budget that you'll see tonight. And you'll see it broken out by sport, and you'll see it broken out by level within sports. So you'll be able to take a look at what each of those cost. But, um, when I talked about the, the cut list that included uh, potentially eliminated freshman sports, what we would be saving is basically those fees other than the coaches' salaries that would still be within the school's budget. Thank you. Okay. Ms. Hennessy? Um, I'm understanding this, I think. Um, one question I have, when I look at, I looked at another district and uh, freshman coaches were getting about 23 up, so it is low. Um, but in, in a district that I know well, we don't have a club unless the students are interested. So, you know, in our my district um, that I work in, it's 15 students need to be interested in participating in it for the club to be funded. So I'm wondering if it wasn't funded or because there wasn't the student interest in it. And are you assuming that it would be an interest now? Is that or would be a requirement for the team to do it? We're we're asking for the uh, coach to go out and recruit students okay. for it to make it open both to the players on the freshman team and to any other person who wants to participate in conditioning. Um, so I would hope with the availability of the club, okay. students would join. But he'll get paid even if not. He'll just get paid because that's the contract that we've decided was my question. Well, I, I mean, if, if we're not doing the conditioning club. See, that's the only part that I would, <coughs> I would vote and support the salary of $1,000 because that's fair. In a separate policy, I mean, one, I would vote for the 835 for a conditioning club, and that's fair. But to have the same person do it, I don't see him while he's busy doing the freshman and thinking that that's all he had was freshman duties now to say, now you're going to have a whole new club. I mean, I just think it's that, you know, I mean, emotionally, he might, he might start to feel like, wow, you're throwing stuff on me just so I can get, so you can keep the contract. And the other thing I wanted to say is I think we need to, to send this to rules and policy to get something that can come back so that we have well, we a have policy a motion, on that. We do have a motion. We have an amendment pending on the floor. Right. So we need okay. to finish our work before. And then if you want to make a motion, that's a different story. Ms. Walczak, did you want to? I just want to bring us back to remember the motion before us is the motion to accept the donation of 1,000 amended to 1835. If we accept the donation and the person doesn't accept the position, we keep looking for somebody else or we don't have a freshman team. The question before us now is will we accept this donation so that we can proceed if everything comes together? Yes, yeah, so we're not actually, this isn't a vote to hire somebody or to, it's just to accept the 18, right. to accept a thousand, to increase the thousand to 1835. That's what we're being asked to accept that. Did you yeah, have a question? Yeah, it has to be me, I guess. So if he doesn't accept the position, so the next person who gets the position now has to do both the baseball and the conditioning club. No. Uh, no. So we're just doing this just to appease him. Whomever this person is, I don't know who it is. So we don't have a conditioning club now. And we don't have people that have expressed interest at all in one. But it so. is a position that's already recognized in the, um, it is a recognized position. Okay, that's so fine. And I agree that you're doing everything transparently by saying it and open. It still feels very backdoor. And sure. while you have them together, I have to vote against it. Although I'm totally 100% in support of freshman teams. And I want to say that every school I've ever seen has <coughs> clubs that support the teams and that otherwise we wouldn't have. And if we start to look at equity, we should look at footballs. And I don't even want to bring that up. Mr. Meyer, did you have a question? Uh, no, I, well, I had just a comment. I, okay. I'll, I'll defer to the 
good member from the the gentle lady, <laughs> the gentle lady, the gentle lady from Ward Six. <laughs> okay. I wonder if I say this, if this will make you feel any better. We are not approving contracts or two positions. Those positions already exist, and the contract is yet to come with an individual. What we are approving, as Ms. Walsack has pointed out, is donation uh, is a gift. And so, really, what the, the, the only unknown here, the big question, is whether the baseball boosters will be okay with spending $835 of the money that they were going to donate to us if it goes to the conditioning club rather than specifically to a, base, a freshman baseball coach. So they said, we'll give $2,000. We said, we only want $1,000 for the baseball coach. But if you really want to give us the other money, we would like to be able to spend it on conditioning. Will you do that? So it, am I correct that that's really that what they this brought is up about? the conditioning club, or we brought no, up? The we club. I think we probably brought it up and said, and said if you have the money before. and you want to give it to us, yep. we will spend it on this, and this person may likely agree to take both of the positions because that's approximately the amount of money he was expecting to get for one position. So there, I guess there are two unknowns, but the first is, is will the Booster Club give us that amount with that condition, and the second is, will the person take the position? But we're not Thank in you. charge of that. We're only in right. charge of accepting a gift of eighteen hundred and whatever it is to go to such and such. Thank you. Two, That's a, I, I, two, you know what two positions. You clarified it exactly how how I understand it already. I just take. Okay. I, I, I find a problem with the, the hypocrisy. Okay. So I have to recognize Mr. Meyer. Mr. Meyer. I, I look forward to the superintendent. Um, improving this process. Um, yes. in, my time, in my time on Please. the in my time on the committee, we have consistently transferred at the end of year um, some tens of thousands of dollars into the athletics revolving fund because it is deficient. And my concern is that well, we all know that athletics would not exist in its current form without the booster club's generosity. That when the booster clubs fall short, or when sports expand because of demand from uh, student athletes that we recognize that athletics are an integral part of our program at the high school and in our schools. And so we feel compelled at that point to make up the shortfall. Mm -hmm. um, and at that point, we're, we're forced to spend money that we didn't intend to spend at the beginning of the year. Um, when I look at $47,000, um, I look at almost an FTE. Um, I look at Mr. Eldridge, whose position was going to be cut significantly a few years back. Um, that you know, this this is not a small amount of money. I mean, even though in the grand scheme of things, as a percentage, it isn't. Um, it, it is. We do make you know choices about ten thousand, fifteen thousand dollars. So I, I really look forward to the superintendent um, digging into this issue, and and it's a it's a very difficult line to walk in terms of recognizing the generosity, but also recognizing that the school committee and the superintendent and the administrative team are trying to have a system that's run with a plan and run with some kind of logic um, so that people don't get frustrated and disappointed as we heard earlier this evening. Okay, and, I, and I, my only clarification w would just be to say that, you know, uh, accepting what Ms. Minnick said about the lax administration and the willingness of it, I, I also want to clarify that I think all the people who were raising the money and trying to support the teams are doing it with the best of intentions. There was no Absolutely. thing nefarious going on. No. And, no. All the talk about backdoor and all that, it's nothing nefarious happening. So Not I just yet. want to put that on the record <laughs> as well. So there's a motion, there's an amendment on the table to amend the gift to $1,835. And it's been seconded. And I would ask all those in favor who support the amendment to say aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. Any abstentions? Okay. So now uh, the main motion before you is a motion to accept a gift from the baseball boosters of $1,835. Uh, and I would ask, is there any questions on that motion? I, okay, so all those in favor of that main motion, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? Aye, nay. Okay, any abstentions? Okay, so the motion uh, carries, nine to one. So the um, next item on the agenda is a, another gift, and this one is uh, a vote to accept for the Northampton High School Ultimate Program. 
uh, an estimated $4,000 for ultimate Frisbee teams. Ms. Walzak. Yes, this is another one we're asking for approval in advance of the event so that the group will know that whatever proceeds they made, they are able to donate to the ultimate Frisbee teams at the high school. This is a um, ultimate disc tournament held for over 40 teams, and in, in the past they've raised about 4000 so that would be their expectation on the amount that would be donated to us at the completion of the tournament. Move to accept the gift of estimated $4,000 for the ultimate Frisbee team with gratitude. Is there a second? Second. Okay, any questions? Uh, Ms. Minnick. Where is this held? Or, or who's sponsoring it? I'm sorry, this is the ultimate? Um, the Oxbow. Right, the Oxbow. Thank you. Okay. This is the second year they've done it? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I was down there last year and my daughter was playing soccer and it was absolutely amazing at the amount of folks that are passionate about playing ultimate Frisbee. <coughs> So mm -hmm. I, I think it's wonderful. I, want, I think it's outstanding that we actually have the honor of being able to host it and we have the Oxbo to be able to do it. Okay. So I guess my question was then, is there any cost to us or is the, uh, will that be taken out of whatever proceeds they, so? They're running the event, so they will cover all the cost. And I think there was a backup sheet. They donate a small portion of the proceeds to two other organizations, and then the balance gets donated to the high school teams. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So there's been a motion made and seconded to accept this uh, gift. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. So uh, the Frisbee uh, gift is accepted. Next, we have a vote to accept a gift, and this is from the Ryan Road PTO toward Nature's Classroom, uh, $235.80. Ms. Walsack? Yes, this is a donation from the PTO to underwrite some additional staffing hours that were involved with this field trip, and we need to put the payroll through our books so that we keep the employee with taxes and workers' comp covered. So the PTO is donating the cost of the additional time for a staff member that attended this trip. Have they done that in the past? I just don't recall having voted on it in the past. They've underwritten the trip. I, I know they have. I yeah. can't address the payroll issues. But I mean, I got I've here. just never seen it here. Yes. Uh, so, okay. Move approval of the, or move acceptance of the gift. Second. Okay. Any discussion about this one? Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. So the gift is accepted. The next is a gift. Uh, this is. Um, from Target, and it is uh, $167.24, and it is for the NHS technology program. <coughs> Target, as with a number of other businesses, has what I would call a loyalty program. If you have a Target credit card, you can sign up for who you would like the quarter of a percent of your sales or whatever it is for each company to come to. So this represents, um, I've, I've dealt with this in other school districts before, this would be targets passing on for that section of the year. I don't know if this represents a whole year or not, but the amount of money that people who had designated Northampton High School on their loyalty card, this represents that percentage of the sales that Target directs back as one of their community outreach programs. And the high school's intent is to put this in the technology account and over time be able to eventually purchase more Chromebooks for use in the high school. Move to accept the um, gift from Target from the rewards program for NHS technology right now of 167.24. Second. Second. Any discussion about this? Well, I just had questions about it. Um, I know Stop and Shop does it. I know Big Y does it. Um, have we done that in the past? Had to approve getting the rewards of it? I mean, I noticed now we're getting more here, and yet in, in real policy, the, uh, we just are taking the I think the Stop the and Shop cards, um, in that case, get paid directly to the PTO. So we. We accept gifts from the PTO, but it's not. Okay, so that's why. Yeah, they're allowed to sign themselves up to receive uh, to receive those kinds of reward programs as a PTO. And so, and Target, so, they're getting it as a we're signing up as a school district. Is that what we're doing, as opposed to an individual school, or what? If I think one of the points is, as we try to wrap in our procedures, some of these that might have fallen through the cracks before will now be following the school committee policy and state laws on donations. Okay, yeah. that's great because that does streamline it. Now, my other question on that is how, who decided that it was going to the high school and then who decided that it was going to technology? 
and is that where it's always going? My understanding is the individual who signs up for the card chooses what school it goes to. I've done this with several as my daughter went through her school years. You pick the individual school you want it to. Um, then it's up to the high school administration to decide what program at the high school it would be directed to. I also recall that the PTO had been running a major technology fund drive the last several years, so it's quite likely that they um, encourage people to sign up through this program to support that. Um, I, I, we, we gave as a family to the technology drive that was happening, so I suspect that's why it's coming in in that form for any, well, obviously for NHS, but for the technology. Okay, so it, would this be open for other of the elementary and or middle school to sign up and also have that going so that they could also help out with it? Or I, would with I would assume so, but I don't know how Target handles their program. Okay. I would assume they would have to, they, they would, it's not really a matter for the school committee. They would have, the PTOs would have to initiate themselves. Right, but I'm, the reason I'm asking is because it is at the school committee, so when they do initiate themselves, it comes to the school and then it goes out. That's like you said differently than, than Stop and Shop or Big Y even. Yeah. Okay. Um, I totally support that it's going for technology. I was just wondering who has control of the purse strings, and it happens to be the person who signed them up. I signed up Brian Road one year. Okay. Any oh. other questions? All those in favor of accepting this, uh, this targeted gift, uh, please say aye. <laughs> aye. <laughs> Sorry, <guys>. <laughs> Opposed? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's accepted. Let's go on to the next uh, item on the agenda. Um, thankfully, it's not a gift. Uh, it's, uh, it's the school calendar, which is like a gift. Um, it's our annual gift uh, to the school district. It's a vote to accept the 2015-2016 district calendar, and I'll turn it over to Dr. Provost. Thank you. In your packets, you have a draft school calendar for the 2015-2016 school year for your consideration with a start date of September 2nd and an ending date of June 16th, 2016. This calendar complies with the rules for uh, school calendars and our contract and I would ask you to, um, to approve the, the start and end date. Move to approve the start and end mandates of the 2015-2016 Northampton Public Schools calendar. Second. Is there a second? Are there any questions? <coughs> okay, Mr. Moore, Ms. Fallon, Ms. Hennessy. Okay. So my, my, my concern as, as is, is my annual concern now um, is there's a little block on the on the calendar form that set, sets the uh, start times for all the schools and I th um, I don't know what the if 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 when we approve this, we're approving the entire page, or if we're really just approving the start and end date. Start and end That's date. Ocean for us is just the start. So I want to clarify that. Yeah, because I would like us to have flexibility to change the start time if we should be able to figure out a way to do it, or actually some of the other details that are on there that are good information to have with your calendar, but maybe aren't things we want to be locked into between now and next year. Ms. Allen? I was just hoping, Dr. Provost, I know that um, a few parents have been concerned about the number of half days in October for conferences at the elementary schools. Can you remind us, I know this calendar we're locked into because of contract negotiations, what, what year's district calendar would reflect us reconsidering that? Sure. Um, and, and in fact, there was a letter signed by several parents to the school committee on this very issue. Um, <coughs> we are currently in... Uh, the second year of a third year contract. One of the provisions in that contract says that the um, last week in October for elementary schools will be scheduled as half days. Um, so we will be finishing the obligation under the current contract with this calendar. If there was successor language or different language in a successor contract, then that could be reflected in a different calendar which would have to be in the 2016-17 year or some later date. Okay, thank you. That was my question. Answered your question? Yeah. Great. Any other calendar-related questions? Okay, hearing none, uh, the motion before you is to approve those uh, start and end dates for the 2015-16 school year. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. The next item uh, before you then is a vote, and this is a required vote uh, relative to uh, continuing the district's participation in the school choice program. And I will turn this over to Dr. Provost. 
I would simply point out that in the projections I gave you last week, considering the out years on our budget and updated ones, which I'll give you when we talk about the um, orientation to the new budget book, um, I anticipated that we would continue to participate in the school choice program and expend a, a little more than one and a half million dollars a year of school choice funds. So I would um, strongly encourage an affirmative vote to continue participation in choice. And this will be the time each year when Ms. Minnick will tell us exactly how we're supposed to vote. And I'm ready next so, year. Oh, Someone take right. notes. That's right. uh, that's Mrs. Minnick, this is a vote. Oh, yeah. The law says that all school districts in the state of Massachusetts are participating unless they have a public session after which they take a vote to withdraw from this. Okay. So we can vote to participate. And if everybody votes yes, that's great. We've taken a stand and made it kind of public that we want to participate. If we take a vote to participate and it should fail, we're still participating because my legal interpretation, I don't know, Ms. Downing, Mr. Meyer can, can correct me if I'm wrong, no. but I believe that we, if we want to get out, we have to be taking a vote to withdraw from participation. And that's the only, so if we take a vote to, part to continue participating and it fails, we're still participating because the state continue, considers you to be participating unless you have okay. a public session. Forum and so our choices are to vote to participate, to yeah, make a motion so to vote to I'm, participate, I'm and everybody vote yes. yes. Okay. We can't yeah. take this vote, but I'm what I'm saying is that this is about as effective as okay. You know, so we, spitting so in the wind. You know, it's like. That's what she's saying. I'd like to make the motion to vote not to withdraw from the school choice. Well, that's the same program. thing. That's the same. No, because now we're still in it, though. Isn't that what she just said? We have to well, not I think, withdraw. I think what she was saying is, by the letter of the law, you'd actually have to make a motion to, to withdraw, withdraw, and the everyone would have to vote, end. and everyone have to vote against right, it. Right, against it. Vote, but we yeah. have backwards it. somehow. Well, so what do you want to say? That would be the way. So I want to do what he just said. So make. But it doesn't count unless like, you had right. the public this session. This is the last year you'll be voting on this, so I think you should make the motion. <laughs> right. well, Remember? I'm going to come back and haunt you. I'm just going to come to a public session every, every month with my thing for that month. You're right. Public comments. So, I mean, go ahead and just have the vote to continue. I'll make the motion. You haven't because made the motion yet. We haven't, we haven't discussed the fact that we would not participate and we haven't had a public okay, fine. forum about okay. it. All right. So, I'm not going to hold you to voting okay. the negative the, or the withdrawal and everybody votes no. Okay. So, saying this is uh, vote. so have, has, has <laughs> someone made a motion here, one way or the other, no. to participate? So we're waiting for a motion in the school um, choice okay. program for the next following school year. Okay. Is there a second? Second. 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 Okay. So there's been a motion made and seconded to continue participation in the school choice uh, program. And uh, is there any further discussion about Is that? Yes or no. I just have a question. Sure. If we went through the process to say that we didn't want to participate in school choice, would that mean that students in our district wouldn't be able to choice out? Or we just wouldn't take choice in? I got it. New choice. And actually, <laughs> correct me if I'm wrong, we would keep the ones that are, we're, mm -hmm. the ones that are already here. We've got them forever. Yeah. We just would not be taking new choice students if we chose. So it would be a just vote takes that more open declining space. thing over time. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, hearing none. All those in favor, uh, please say aye. 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 Any uh, opposition? Any abstentions? Okay, so uh, so we'll continue in the school choice program. Uh, now, the next item on the agenda is a orientation to the FY16 budget book. Do we? Are we doing a present? An overhead presentation? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think what I'll do is call a two minute recess so we can get the technology set up uh, and then we'll um, and then we'll uh, resume the meeting. Okay, so we're reconvening uh, now at the school committee on uh, Thursday, March 12th, 2015. Uh, we're now moving into a presentation uh, by the superintendent of the uh, FY16 uh, budget book orientation. I'll turn it over to the superintendent. Thank you. I just want to open by being clear that this is not a comprehensive discussion of the FY16 budget. But as I explained in the first 
you budget. We're uh, presenting the budget in a different style um, than any of you are familiar to seeing it. So I just wanted to take a few moments to go through what's included in the budget document and orient you to some features that I think will help you as you study the document in preparation yeah. for our discussion of it at our next opening meeting, March 26th. So, um, first I just want to talk about the organization of the budget. Um, first, there are, there's an overview that includes some general information in my budget statement. You'll also see the first few budget, so you'll be able to compare this document to the sort of very um, condensed version of the budget that I presented in the first few budget. And then you'll see that um, the budget is reported in cost centers. Um, some of the the cost centers were in, in prior budgets, but um, we, we tried to make them clearer in this budget and tried to um, make them e easier to use for those who are responsible for managing the cost centers by giving each an individual task. Um, after the cost centers, we'll give you information about grants and revolving accounts and any other non-appropriated sources of funding, um, such as all of the funding that the boosters provide for us. Um, and then some information from the Department of Education concerning school finance, and then a miscellaneous section, which includes um, two, two pieces that I've never seen in a budget before, but I'd really like to thank um, Ms. Walzak for bringing to the budget process. One is the DOE budget codes that explain that long series of numbers that precedes every line item in the budget. So sort of understand why those numbers are there and, and what they mean. And second, a glossary of important uh, school finance terms. So then what I'd like to do is just walk you through some key pieces of each of the sections. I'm not going to go through them in detail, but I just want to point out some things that I think will be helpful to you as you study the budget. Um, first, uh, first, I'd like to say that the overview is probably the most important section in terms of understanding the budget as a whole. And within it, there is one very important document. It's found um, after the pie charts, <coughs> the section that call, that's called FY16 Budget Staff FTEs. Five section. <laughs> Could you repeat that? Yeah. yeah it's called uh, FY16 budget staff FTEs. It comes right after the pie chart for the FY16 budget. Chart. couple of things that I'd like to point out about this. First, there's a five column format that I would is really critical for understanding this budget. One of the things we talked about in the first few budget was providing a way to understand um, the, the story or the track the money as it gets reclassified and broken into different budget centers. Um, in order to help you do that, we're reporting everything in five columns. The first column is the FY15 current. And since this is an FTE chart, which is a full-time equivalent chart, um, these represent staff. Those are positions that are funded from the current budget. The next column is FY15 other funding. That represents, in this FTE chart, any positions that are funded from non-appropriated sources like grants, boosters, et cetera. Then you'll see the next column, which is the column that um, we're really voting on when it gets time to vote the budget, which is the proposed FY16 line. Here it's FTEs, but later on in the budget it'll be dollar amounts. And then you also see the FY16 um, 
positions in this chart that we're hoping to fund from other sources. And then the final column shows the total change. This is blind to source of funding, so it, com it combines FY15 current FTEs and FY15 other funding and shows the difference between FY16 FTEs and FY16 other funding. So um, one of the things that, one of the reasons why I say this chart is so important is as funds are reclassified from one cost center to another or from one reporting category to another, it causes some distortions when you look in terms of dollar amounts. But if you look at FTEs, I think you get a much better representation of um, whether staff are being added or eliminated at all of the, at each of the individual cost centers. So then if you follow this chart all the way down um, to page five, <coughs> see the totals in the footer. Um, we are proposing a budget that has an overall reduction of two and 2.6 positions, roughly two and a half positions. Now, remember, this is a level service budget, but within the level service budget, we asked administrators to make trades to, to reorganize the budget if possible in order to get some of their um, in or, some of their budget priorities in a cost neutral way. So the loss in the FTEs that's re represented there is um, essentially positions, mainly ESP positions that principals said they would give up in order to use those money, that money to fund other positions. So overall, um, when you look through the whole budget, it's a change of two and a half positions. So I just want to sort of put <coughs> that piece out in the over. And I also want to point out the five column system because even though um, you're looking at it in terms of FTEs in this section, you'll be looking at it in terms of dollar amounts when we get to the individual students. Um, then I'd like to uh, discuss some good news and some bad news, um, which is reflected in section two. Um, since our last meeting, um, the mayor graciously added 55,000 340 of Chapter 70 funds, which the district saw as an increase in the governor's budget um, to the school budget. As you'll recall, last meeting we left with about a $30,000 deficit. So when you add that money back in, um, we're 20,000 to the good. And so we had no issues to deal with. Then uh, the governor eliminated $92,000 in kindergarten grant. So um, we had already planned for the 19,936 9C budget cut to become permanent. Remember, that was one of our budget assumptions. Um, I thought we were budgeting conservatively when we said, let's just plan for the 9C cut to become permanent. One of the things that we did not ever really foresee in any realm of possibility is that the kindergarten grant would be eliminated Amazing. entirely. So now um, we have a budget that's $51,000 in deficit. Um, so the first few tab um, can, which I'm sorry, the, the second tab is the first few budget. It includes revised budget projections based on these um, two numbers. So you'll see that at the end of the first budget I gave revised scenario. In, both of, in all of these revised scenarios, what we assumed was that the 55,340 would be added to the budget and that we would find, just like we did with the high school late start, we'd find 50, essentially $52,000 in cuts at the elementary school level in order to restore kindergarten or um, maybe get run into a little bit of luck in the legislative process and have um, the House or Senate restore the kindergarten grant um, or do something else. That is my strong um, hope. They have to restore it. Um, there are other options. Um, as I said, tonight's not the budget discussion, but I'll tell you one of the things that's been happening on the superintendent listserv, um, it's really worse 
than a snow day call. Everyone's saying, are you still going to do kindergarten? Are you going to go to half day? Are you going to start doing fees? Because we're all grappling with what do we do to continue to run kindergartens with this significant cut. It's very significant for us and it's even larger for some other districts. But anyways, um, in the in tab two, you'll see that the, the um, first few budget has revised scenarios that assumes that we uh, will find the 52,000 either within our budget or um, have it restored <laughs> through other sources. And, and you'll see that when you run out those um, future years in the budget scenario, uh, that small change makes a pretty dramatic difference. Um, one of the things means that instead of having a small deficit, if we go with scenario one, which was adding no new programs, there's no deficit. In 2017, it's a you know, tiny amount of <coughs> deficit, and it's um, really not until 2018 or 2019 that we get in trouble. So one of the things that this process showed me is you know, we're, we're so close to a margin here, or so close to an inflection point, that any money we can save now is really going to have a tremendous impact in the out years. Um, so I also um, redid the other two scenarios. Um, the second one shows what if we dedicated $100,000 a year to new programs, and you see um, there, in the prior one, I think we ran into deficit in 2018. Now it's not until 2019, but it is still an over million dollar deficit that year. And then um, we also did the, the um, revised stability scenario where we're increasing school choice. And that one you can see with this small change, we're actually increasing our beginning balance in choice budgets every year till 2017 and are not really starting to hit those accounts heavily until 2018 and we can even get through 2019. So, I mean, I guess that just shows the lesson of every $50,000 is going to make a big difference in the long run. So I just want to point that out. Then I, I um, wanted to go through one cost center to sort of show you the organization. They're all organized the same way. So we'll look at Bridge Street. The first thing you'll find in each of the cost centers is a profile. This is really um, our attempt to provide accountability in a way that is other than just test scores. Um, one of the things that we'd like to present to the taxpayers is what we've done with the money um, in the current budget, what we're hoping to do with the money in the upcoming budget, and that's all reflected in a profile for each cost center. The next section is budget notes. This is, again, another help to try to explain the transition from the prior budget format to the new budget format. It explains anything that we think um, may be um, special that's happening with the finances within that cost center, um, sort of anticipate questions that people might have. And then you have the FTE report for the cost center. Just like there was an FTE report in the overview for the entire district, each cost center has its own individual FTE report. And then you have the cost center budget, which again follows that five column format, only this time instead of reporting FTEs, it's reporting the dollars that are associated with those FTEs and the dollars that are associated with expenses. And then the last piece in each cost center is the expense accounts. These are non-personnel costs. Um, and there we have the 2014 actuals, the 2015 budget, and the 2016 request. Um, and so that, that same format just repeats in cost center after cost center. Um, in miscellaneous, that's tab number 15. Um, you find information around um, capital projects for the, for the district. You also find that the <coughs> chart that I gave you and, or that I mentioned earlier, and the glossary um, that I also mentioned earlier. So um, that's essentially how the budget book is set up. Our thought is that um, by giving it out now, it provides opportunities to study 
prior to the time we have to come together for discussion. And what I would really encourage is if you have questions about the budget book as you go through the budget book, please send them to Candy or send them to me so that we can get the information back to you prior to the public discussion on the, on the budget. Um, if one thing we'll do is sort of compile a list of frequently asked questions. So if something is coming from more than one member, we'll assume that may be a, something that's unclear in the budget or something that um, just naturally raises questions for others. So we'll make that part of our presentation, <clears throat> sort of introduce this for the discussion on the budget. Um, but there it is. Okay. So, um, oh, yes, Ms. Smith. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> I second that. Well, <laughs> thank you for the wow. wow. <laughs> and wow to you, yeah. too. Yeah. Yes. Thank you yeah. very much. Yeah. This is really kind of amazing. Yeah. You're going to spoil us. Okay. So, can I just can I ask you just a sort of a technical question? So, sure. um, I don't want to say if, when the House of Representatives uh, <laughs> increases chapter 70, restores kindergarten, and, you know, uh, gives a budget that's better for the district than, uh, than Governor Baker's budget, will you then have, like, give us pages to insert, or ha will, how, how will changes be made? If you have to One of our thoughts with going with three ring binder instead of um, something that's bound yeah, you know, yeah. in another format so that if there are changes as this budget process rolls out and we have new scenarios to bring you we can just give you pages to replace okay. the ones that are All right. in here. Okay. because it's uh, to follow up on the mayor's question because it is um, something that we this is wow that we get to actually look at and I mean really look at and analyze um, this is just wow. Do we get to, um, as they come up, are you going to like send us maybe an email or an update just so that we know to put it in our mind prior to having to come? And one of the things in the past, and I haven't been on the board as long as Miss Minnick, so I mean my wow probably isn't as loud as hers, but but we have it in advance to really look at. It's broken down really easily, and I'd like to know if there are any changes that I can take it in. We can take it into the next meeting already knowing that, as opposed to waiting. So if, if they, you know, if it's something significant, maybe just email us out. You know, yay, kindergarten got. I mean, I'm sure I'd hear that, but you know what I mean. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Any other questions, uh, Mr. Moore? Um, will Will this this material be available to the public? So thank you for bringing that up. Um, I, I would, I guess, ask the committee's pleasure on that. I would love to put this on the website so that between now and the time of public discussion, um, the public has an opportunity to review. But I don't know if you're comfortable with that happening before we formally discuss this. Um. Anyone but me? Yeah, it's me. <laughs> <laughs> I know, anybody but me. Well, no, no, no. <laughs> More I'm obvious, Mayor. Um, <laughs> Mr. Duvall, I was just calling. I know. I'm just giving you a hard time. It's dark. <laughs> <laughs> it's late. <laughs> it was going to be a benign question, and now you just upset me, and I forgot. So. I think the open meetings law requires. Well, it's a public doc. It's a public yeah. record. The open, right. open you, meetings law. It to us, it's yeah. a public. It requires record, that so it's not. I don't think we have a choice. No. Um, so I would. I say think it would be good to be on it too, on though. Website, but with a with a, transparent. You know, make sure that. It, this is still the draft and mm -hmm. subject to you know, change. So, yeah. That's what I was going to say, and I was going to say that, it's yes, hello, it, it's still me. I, that's what I was going to say, and it gives everybody a chance to look and, and um, write in letters of support, or they, they can also analyze it. The public can also look at it and say, what do you mean this is what you're doing? And also get an idea of how difficult it is and how much we've really pinched all these pennies down. I mean, there's not a lot of room, and maybe somebody can find room for this what's new. Can you just tell me the, the timeline? What, what are we looking at? What, when are we going to have all of our information from the state, all the information June. from the, the, school from the city, all of everything? The school committee is required to vote by April 15th. But we'll have. And I'm supposed to submit a budget. I'm supposed to submit my budget 30 days later by May 15th. The House is expected to introduce its budget at the beginning of April. I'm not going to date certain on that, but they are. They traditionally submit their budget beginning first week in April so um, and my rule of thumb is generally the house budget tends to be the closest to the budget that usually gets 
becomes the final budget. So, um, so, so you don't expect these cuts that they're proposing to be reversed? They no, are. I'm saying that I think that if they are going to happen, we're going to know about it in April. Okay. And there are some significant deviations from what the House and the Senate has done in the past. Um, you know, we did get increases in local aid, uh -huh. which the governor's been saying, yay, great stuff. But then the minimum contribution to communities that get Chapter 70, like Northampton, has been for the last you know, five plus years, $25 per child. He's lowered it to $20 per child. So it's actually, it's a cut. It's an increase, but it's a cut based on the past practice. So there's a bunch of different things that have so the city budget, just to give you a, a sense of this, we plugged in all of the revenue, all of the uh, expenditures, all the charter school, everything. We're getting $100,000 less than we got last year total from the state when you factor in everything. So, we're so you're not going to give us any extra from the well, city I, They just budget. did. I have committed to giving the mm -hmm. district already. Right, but I meant beyond. I, was just, <laughs> I, just, I don't understand at what point like this is really like a done deal because we have to adjust up until the last well, minute. We're going we're we're gonna to have to June. pass a budget in May. We're required right. to by law. They're required to by June 31st. <laughs> um, and then, you know, if we have to make adjustments, we make adjustments, but we have to pass a budget. Right. And so we have to go with the information that okay. we have. And typically you, you those adjustments that, right? aren't we on We have the... to pass ours before mm -hmm. we pass theirs. Right. So we are shooting in the dark, sort right. of. We just have to go on whatever yeah. estimates we've received. Okay. So if they do something great after the fact, then we get to add more money in. I mean, though. thank goodness we're out of town. I mean, Amherst had to pass theirs by, had to submit a budget by April 5th, uh, by January 15th. Mm -hmm. Right. Had to right. submit a budget any figures before they even saw the governor's budget. Yeah. That's um, and so now, but I mean, that's just the rules of how town is in town meeting and all the other things happen, but that's the issue. Um, which is why it would be great to get better predictability on local share of state revenue. The governor, to his credit, I'll give him credit for this, he has said he wants to tie um, the state revenue to how much local aid goes to, you know, unrestricted local aid. So he's actually keeping that promise, which was that, you know, local aid revenues, state revenues are projected to go up like three point something percent. He's raising unrestricted local government aid three point something percent as well. So, um, but it would be great, obviously, the foundation review committee that we all went to is finishing its work they may propose things so yeah that's the that's the big issue is that there's never any predictability so for the public they're like wait a you know they don't mm -hmm. they, why do they keep changing the numbers but right. we're not changing it's not us i mean there's uh, right well that's kind of why to be clear for this yeah. is now public to make sure that everybody understands that we it could also them. be cut further too. I don't. Right. I also don't. I know. Well, that's it's kind of the that's kind of the concern that it could go either way. So that's the other issue is we don't uh, know it could go worse. Right. Um, so that's why we have to use the information that we have, and that's for now. It's the governor's budget, and then we'll see what the house proposes. Okay. Just because she's a new member, I'm asking this question. In the past, um, the budget day has changed. In the past, when when did we used to do the budget? Wasn't it like further closer out? It wasn't in April 15th. That is correct. Right. So when was it that we used to, like... Well, oddly, the school committee would sometimes keep working on the budget right up until the end. That's what I thought. The difficulty is that, you know, the city count... You know, I have to present a final city budget now, and so that number has to be fixed. That overall number gets fixed for the school committee to work with once we vote that budget. So, um, and that, so that's just the constraint we have. Well, and even then, once the budget's fixed, aren't there still that last-minute jockeying in the summer when you have twice as many kindergartners as roll enroll as sometimes as you expected, or less than you? Well, expected? that's why we have school choice and we right. have reserves, so that if those things happen, just like the city has reserves, so that if those kinds of things happen, that we are able to make adjustments. Okay. Yeah. Asking here, we have reserves for you, Mr. I just, I just had a question for the business minister. I just was um, curious as to. Um, on the expenditure summary from the end of your report, um, whether there is a way to track what ends up in each one of these categories easily. I mean, does does Desi have a guidance document on, for instance, because you look and you see that there's teachers and there's specialists and then there's other instructional coordinators and team leaders. 
Is there, I know obviously there is a way because they all have to be done. Um, is there a guidance document? Is there a book as far as trying to track where, a, they, where they each end up? What they call a chart of accounts on their website, which right. is supposed to be our guiding document in terms of what gets charged where. Yeah. It's not as detailed as I would say in a perfect world it should be. I called and them actually and, and, and <laughs> tried to speak to someone there because I looked at it and it was very vague and they called back and said, nah, not really. So I was wondering, so it's, it's basically each business administrator does that according to their practice, but in, you know, with their experience of what I, I don't know if I would say it's up to each person. I mean, we have, and we can talk about, we can look at it sometime whether you're looking right. at the same document that, that we use, because I went through it quite a few times even doing this after all my years of doing it. Right. Um, but if you're looking like for a specific position, it doesn't say, it doesn't list every position a right. school department could have and say where to put it. It more talks about the general description of jobs should be placed here, and that does leave it to interpretation. But with the millions of different job titles you could have, there might not right. be an option. Yeah. In the past, it had salaries. Um, is it now? Am I going to find that within it? The salaries, or, or is it a different? I mean, it looks totally different than any in the past I've ever received. In this document, it doesn't list. Last year, what you got in that budget book did not have names of people with mm -hmm. salaries. It just said kindergarten teacher, five, you know, fifty-two thousand right. one hundred eighty dollars, um, one FTE. You're not going to see that level of detail in this document. Okay, so we don't know how much, but but it all reflects how many we have. We just don't know their pay scales or steps or anything. Pay scale of the contracts you've negotiated. Right, okay. But it's not in the budget like it's been. I'm sorry about the question, I mean, because you've done a wonderful job and you probably have no idea why they might have done it like that in the past. I don't, I'm not, but that's what I'm just wondering what we're looking at and how that's broken down differently. So we're not looking at salaries now, we're looking at just positions. You're looking at the... the t the number of positions in each line item and the money for that. I mean, you could, in theory, divide it out and get the average for each position in that line item if you wanted to. It's, it's, I think that's of limited value, but right. um, that data is all in the spreadsheets I work with, but it didn't seem like it was something that needed to be here, because I don't see there to be a lot of value to say, well, you've got one teacher in there at 52,980, and you've got another teacher in at 7120, and another one in at 45 who's beginning versus veteran. I'm not sure that's really a value to a school committee when you're looking at it. It's more how many positions do you have. And and actually, because it's an open document, I think that it's more sensitive to do it the way that you've done it this year. Because, I mean, if you only have one person, you're, everyone's going to know their salary. I mean, and that's kind of so. I mean, I, I really like the way you both have done it. It's very easy to read so far. Look at. Do you have anything else? Other questions? Okay. Okay, so everybody knows what the homework is, right? So yeah. Yeah, right. memorize the book. Going home, going over this, directing heard. our questions to the business administrator or the superintendent. They're going to compile the uh, comments to see if there's any themes to go with it so they can bring it back to us. The things that they think need further clarification that they can't clear up by just getting back to you either by phone or email. And I believe we agreed that the deadline for those questions would be next year. Unless you have one on Friday, then they'll say, please, don't do it in the meeting. <laughs> okay. Okay. Tell these questions are going to be obvious. Because they're the ones that are like, so specific and funny. <laughs> but I could not possibly. Okay, so um, <laughs> we will um, now uh, move on to the next item on the agenda. Uh, this is a vote that we need to take. This is a vote to authorize uh, the school, the use of school choice funds for a pay adjustment for a staff member. And I will, um, I'll turn this over uh, to the business administrator to explain the background on. Okay. As I was working through analyzing the, F, the current fiscal year staffing cost and going into budgeting out for FY16, I discovered an underpayment of a part-time teacher on staff. Um, it's a high school situation where they teach a certain number of classes each semester and the person was in the budget last year for two classes each semester and it turned out that mid-year her workload was increased to three classes and for whatever reason and there's a lot of paperwork on it was denied that it was approved the actual <coughs> paperwork never got into payroll to be processed so it appears that we owe the teacher some pay adjustment for the current year because she's also teaching a total of five classes over the two semesters and we owe her that same adjustment for last year. 
So the, the number that's in here, I actually would, would ask if the motion could be up to the amount of money listed in here because we're still investigating. There might have been a week or two at the beginning of the semester that she did not teach the class as they realized they had the numbers and needed that extra class. Much. So we're looking into exactly how many days could she could give us that, that number class? because yeah. we don't, the current agenda doesn't have that on there. So if, oh, if okay. you could. Um, so the, the amount that, uh, I apologize, I'm not sure what happened to the memo. So the amount I had in it was requesting approval to use, I will now say up to $9,897.57 in additional school choice monies to cover prior year payroll. So what was it again? 9000 $9, Eight nine seven point five seven. Okay. okay, I'd like to make a motion to authorize use of school choice funds to adjust the pay of up to nine thousand eight hundred and ninety seven dollars and fifty seven cents. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion or questions about this? I just have one question. Did she notice? Did the person notice that they didn't get paid? I mean, did Ms. you Walzer. find this? We found this. We, we have met with her and reviewed everything with her. We wanted to also get further confirmation that the change in classes had happened. Awesome. Thank you. Um, Mrs. Minnick. Um, I, I understand this request, and I, it's fine. But it, I, even as this was coming to us and it's using school choice funds, and I was just looking in the category back here, that's school choice funds. And, and it, I guess what I'd like to ask is whether I know what's happened over time and, how school, and that we now rely on school choice funds. My speech from the last meeting, notwithstanding about how it used to be for one-time expenses on things that we'd just really like to have, I recognize that it's part of our budget now. I guess my question is, as you've done, as you've analyzed <coughs> things and gone through this, do you believe that that we have that we are applying the school choice funds in the in an I don't want to say the right place, but I mean, do you believe that that school cho choice funds are being, and I'm not saying, are we using them pr appropriately? I'm saying, is it organized in a way that makes sense, or should we be restructuring the budget so that ESPs comes out of appropriation and the and the school choice funds are used for some other category? That's what I'm Well, I can address what we ended up doing in the budget because I was quite shocked when I came in and found the number of things that were being paid out of school choice and it makes any kind of analysis very difficult when you've got part of an expense paid here and part of an expense paid here. So that was the one thing that jumped out at me immediately, you know, utilities being an example, but I could go on and on with expenses. It made it very hard to do analysis. So as we've talked about at some of my past reports, we're actually beginning to move some of those expenses back into the local budget this year and put some salaries into school choice. The, the decision we made for next year, basically, you've got $1.6 million a year in school choice monies to use. You've got to use it for something. Right. So the decision we made is we, we tried to figure out how to streamline it and making it easier going forward to do an analysis over time was to put as much of the ESP costs as we could into school choice. No matter what you do, you're going to have some cost there and some cost here. But by doing it with, with ESPs, it's very obvious when you go to the line items in the local appropriation, when you look at that, you're going to see zeros for most of those lines, which is going to be a flag to say, okay, where is it? To me, that's a neater method to keep track of, for lack of a better phrase, than having a little bit of this, a little bit of that, a little bit of this, a medium bit of this, a little <laughs> bit of this. Because then you've got all those line items and you have no way when you look at your local budget to know which ones are in school choice without doing a lot of digging. This makes it a little more obvious. You're going to see a lot of zeros except in one school for ESPs, which is going to send the flag up to say, where's the cost? So if you look at the school choice budget in the book under the grants and revolving, all but $15,000 is earmarked for ESP salaries. And, and to be clear, I mean, the, the school choice f account sort of acts like, a, like the stabilization account on the city side of sorts it's a, it's a reserve fund because it doesn't flow it doesn't flow to free cash it doesn't it stays where it is so it's kind of in your interest to you know you know obviously budget it in a way that's clear and understandable but at the end of the year if you have excess funds to make sure you utilize your appropriation funds first yes. so that you do keep a reserve of the school choice yes. because otherwise then all of the appropriation monies would flow to free cash. So that's the other reason. I mean, you don't have stabilization accounts in, in 
in the uh, school finance like we have on our side so we can put money in like a rainy day fund and it doesn't go away at the end of the year um, so this is just you know we call it school choice which gives it like should is there like something that's specialized or we're supposed to use it but it's effectively kind of like a stabilization fund um, is, how it, is how most districts use it we maintained what had been done in the past here that the amount of school choice money as well as the amount of circuit breaker monies that are coming in this year based on current numbers are what we're recommending to be used for next year so until we get further out in some of the charts we've talked about the hope is to use one year the money that comes in it makes it easier budgeting we have a pretty good handle right now what's going to come in this year so we can rely on spending that next year whereas things could change next year and the revenues could drop next year and we don't want to build next year's budget on next year's potential revenues so there's been a history here in other communities of having a one-year delay what you take in this year you you spend in your budget next year Mr. Meyer. So just a question, after, um, after the override <coughs> passed and the school department received additional money for that year's budget, there was $202,000 that um, the way that uh, we had looked at it previously was that we had prior year's school choice that had not been expended. So at the end of the year, um, any school choice that had not been expended uh, was then carried over as a reserve and that was basically um, allowed by the mayor rather than being returned to the city um, and I'm just wondering at this point we are not we're not spending current year school choice um, but do we have is there any reserve or is that at zero at this point we're basically spending we're budgeting to spend everything from this year next year um, everything that's coming in this year next year but we don't have any reserve from prior years left my understanding is the amount that was in the budget to spend this year was the balance from the okay. from last year basically okay I, I, just to follow up on that so how did it work in your prior district would the town take back no, unspent the town, towns can't take back school okay, choice school choice school yeah choice right. and i'm talking about a pro, i'm talking about appropriation that's state law any yeah. un, unspent yeah. appropriation okay. monies by state law go back to flow the to free family. cash yeah okay yeah. yeah that's not unique to northampton okay good medicare is the only thing you can grab right uh, Medicare reimbursement? Can't the city keep that? Well, we, that it, that does come to us by law. That comes to us directly by law. Yeah. Yeah. So but you could keep it. You don't, but you. Could. Um. I well, this is one of those. Yeah, we we could go into the history of it, but um, yeah, it's a it's a relatively minor amount. But yeah, what we do that is a revenue that comes to the city. But I think you'll find that you're getting it in your appropriation budget. Yeah. Okay, so it's, I'm sorry for the digression. It was just school okay. choice related. No. So now we have a motion that's been made and seconded to go ahead and expend these choice funds to adjust the pay of this uh, retroactively and, and in the current budget year of this particular high school uh, faculty member. Any further questions? To clarify, this vote is only to address last year. Last year. The current year will be dealt with in this year's budget, so it does not need a vote. Exactly. Okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Next, we have a discussion. Uh, this is from the WMELC. I don't know what that acronym You'll have to explain that. Position statement. Uh, and this will turn to uh, Ms. Hennessy. Sure. Um, Western Massachusetts Education Leaders Coalition. It's a long acronym. Um, so, in July of 2014, so this past um, summer, a group of 10 school systems, leaders in school systems, got together to discuss um, the impact of federal and state initiatives and mandates and how it was impacting, um, how it was shaping public education here in, the, in Massachusetts and our local communities. And so they came up with, and you all were sent this, um, a position statement um, with three major points, and I'll be really brief about it. It was a compromise position that they agreed to. There were school committees and superintendents, I think uh, 12 superintendents, no, 10 school districts, two education collaboratives, um, 12 school committee members were on it, and nine superintendents. So, and there's a list of those um, systems who were on it, and an, an, an additional one <coughs> recently signed on. So basically, they came up with this position with three points. One is concern about the amount, pace, and cost of unfunded mandates, and that's from um, the Common Core, new frameworks for evaluation, DDMs, which are district determined measures for how we evaluate everyone, every teacher, educators, including the superintendent, um, and the high stakes standardized testing, including PARC. 
that um, that was the first concern. The second concern was the validity, reliability, and implementation of PARC. Um, and you could read that. That was a concern. And the third was the amount, frequency, and cost of standardized testing. And I'm going to just, um, for the first point, I'm going to say one more thing. And then the third point, I'm going to give you some numbers. The first point um, about the amount, pace, and cost of unfunded mandates. I mean, I feel like sometimes in here we're, we're fighting over crumbs. Um, but it, from 1996 to 2008, there were 312 documents per year that required attention, multi-page documents that required attention from the districts. From 2009 to 2013, there was uh, 1,077 documents. That's a dramatic increase. Um, the third point, amount, frequency, and cost of standardized testing. Um, this is not an opposition to tests, nor, and nor is it an opposition to all standardized tests. There's a usefulness to it, and they recognize that in the position statement. However, between um, grades 3 and 10 in Massachusetts, a child will sit for at least 39 test sessions, um, which disrupts teaching and learning. Um, and I just think that's profound. And just today, I uh, spoke to a principal in another district who felt like, well, Mass uh, MCAS took a significant amount of time. Park is even more of an administrative nightmare. So the goal of this position was to have as many school committees and educational collaboratives sign on so that um, DESE, the Department of Education, will be um, aware of our concerns as they're making future policies. So I would love it so to vote on it, not tonight, obviously, to send, um, to endorse the statement on for um, Northampton Public Schools and the superintendent, for the school committee rather, and then, um, so that's my hope. And that's why I'm bringing it up. I asked Dr. Provost to um, have it on the agenda for today. Okay. Um, Ms. Minnick. Go ahead, if you, did you need to say something? No, no, I just, at some point I was gonna recognize Dr. Provost, so you go, go ahead. Why don't you let him speak first? If he wanted to speak. Sure. Um, I, I guess what I would like to do is address each of the three points in, in a little bit of detail. But say, overall, although I'll be um, expressing some concerns with the position statement, none of the concerns are rise to a level that would cause me to withhold support. But I just think they should be expressed. Um, so with respect to the first point, I agree wholeheartedly um, that it, the, the pace and cost of the unfunded mandates is to <coughs> overwhelming for districts of any size to deal with. Whether you're a large district, a moderate sized district, or a small district, it's been too much. And in my conversations with administrators and teachers, one of the things that binds us all together besides care for kids is the feeling of just responding to so much stuff that's coming on us from, from external forces. Um, so I, I have absolutely no reservation on the first one. With respect to the second one, um, I do have a little bit of a concern with one part of the way that the statement is written, and it talks about um, the difficulty of trying to implement new high stakes tests at the same time as trying to implement new curriculum frameworks. And I just take a little bit I'm just a little concerned with the way that that is written because the new curriculum frameworks were actually approved several years ago and they should be in place now. Uh, and I, I, I think it somewhat sets up a response that says, well, you've had all these years and you haven't aligned your curriculum yet. You need a test to get you to align. Um, and that you know, also um, I think reminds me of one of the most discouraging things that I've ever experienced as an educator. It was a Title I conference and um, they, they were discussing some changes to the framework. The, the commissioner was discussing some changes to the framework and a teacher got up and said, I'm not teaching anything new unless you put it on a test because I'm only held accountable to tests. My district's only held accountable to tests. And so please, let's start with the test and then we'll work our way backwards, which has kind of like completely inverted um, yeah. education. But I, I just, so I do have that, that small concern with section two. Um, and I did share that with some of the authors of this document and um, they did acknowledge that that could be a, a potential problem with the wording. So I just throw that out there. And then um, with number three, 
I don't, I don't have a, a concern with the third part as it's written here, but I do have a concern with the way some of this is being spun, at, especially at the federal level, as we're going through um, the beginnings, finally, of reauthorization of ESEA, which is the giant federal um, uh, education funding bill. It's been overdue for reauthorization several years. I just want to um, read from some testimony that was taking place as part of the deliberations on reauthorization. This is a, a quote from a superintendent um, who's representing a, a particular point of view. And he was talking about data that had been collected in the district, which is also data that's been collected in Massachusetts, uh, comparing the amount of time teacher that, that students lose to state mandated tests and federally mandated tests as opposed to the amount of time they lose due to teacher created tests. And so the quote is, I, um, I indeed, the data shows that the bulk of testing time is devoted not to those tests, he's talking about high stakes tests, but to state and local exams. A new report from the Ohio Department of Education, for example, found that federal tests accounted for less than a third of overall testing time. So you can see there's a narrative that's starting to be um, developed at the federal level, and it even has been picked up a little bit at the state level that says, you know, all you people who've said there's too much testing going on, you're right, and the villains are the teachers. Most of the tests that kids take are tests that were teachers created, um, not these state mandated tests. So if you want to really relieve students, what you should do is say, we need to place limits or pro prohibitions on <laughs> teachers from creating their own tests and just go with the, the standardized tests. Um, so I did express that as well. And um, one thing that, that um, Dr. Gazda pointed out in this is that st statement number three, talk specifically about standardized tests. And it's very um, unlikely that a teacher would develop a standardized test for use in his or her own classroom. Um, so I just wanted to put those out as potential things to think about as you, as you consider this. Again, I say that's just for discussion, not that it causes me to say that this is bad or that it, it shouldn't be supported. Um, I did also explore with him the idea of if members had different levels of comfort with different parts of the statement, is it an all or nothing present? proposition. He said any level of support for any part of this is welcome. He also said that um, anyone who wants to participate in the group, um, whether a, a member of the school committee or a member of administration is welcome to participate. And I also um, reached out to MASC to see if they have a position with respect to this position. And um, they have not formally taken it up yet. So there's no, no um, recommendation for or against for M from MASC. So that's all I wanted to say. Did you want to respond briefly before I before I recognize other? Uh, I would love to respond, but I don't have to go first. Okay. I, I just I want to ask you a question because um, as a board member of the Collaborative for Educational Services, I do not recall that this was ever discussed by the board, and yet I see support by the Collaborative for it, and also from Lower Pioneer Valley Collaborative. Was it presented to the superintendents at a steering committee meeting, and was there any discussion, or is this, uh, and the, I mean, <coughs> collaborative is made up of member districts, so if, if the member districts haven't discussed it and taken a vote, I'm curious as to how the collaborative, and so I would be approaching that, but I wanted to be sure before I go lambaste somebody that, that about not talking to me <laughs> that, that they didn't talk with the steering <laughs> committees about it. Do you know? Uh, I, I do not know. Um, this statement says that it was adopted in July of 2014, which would have been just about the time I was coming on board. So there may have been discussion prior to that. I, I just don't know. They said it was the executive directors of both, but I don't know the discussion. Well, I, and I don't think, that I, I'm, I guess, I'm glad that they attended the mm -hmm. discussion and that they are supportive of this, mm -hmm. but I'm, I'm a little concerned that they would, uh, that they can commit an organization that's made up of a lot of districts that haven't mm -hmm. yet have had the chance to commit. Mm -hmm. That's my only concern. Mm -hmm. So I will raise it with them. But I don't think that changes our um, position here. So you're looking perhaps for at some future meeting for a resolution to support this? To support the endorsement. Okay. Yeah. 
Did you want to respond yet, or do you want to hear from other folks? I guess I'd like to respond briefly. I'm sorry, Ms. Duvall. Um, I, I understand your, your comments. I think the way that this was worded, specifically about number three, that's so clearly about standardized tests. And I think I w you know, people would welcome that discussion mm -hmm. <laughs> on how great teacher assessments are needed. And, um, and as for the park, you know, I think, and I also know the communication you've had, part of the, it's the technological Im implementation as well as the textbook implementation. And it's, we don't even have the results from last, the, the testing that happened last year. So um, I have so much more to say on the park test, but I think the, it was a nice compromise to say the vali validity, reliability, and implementation of the park exam. There have been so many problems with that. Um, and they don't even say, which I'm only saying here, um, that the commissioner is on the board. Um, that is a problem. Uh, it is an, you know, I, I say all the time I can't give a $50 <coughs> Dunkin' Donuts gift card to my first grade, my son's first grade teacher, but he could be on this board and we could be paying a lot of money for this. Um, and the uh, last thing I'd say is I would like to fully endorse it only because I hate it when I'm part of a group of a lot of people and we make a lot of compromises and talk a lot and then someone else comes in and says we'll sign on but here's our mm -hmm. amendment to it. So mm -hmm. I like that it where it is now. I would of course I would personally make it stronger but I think it's a solid position that a school committee um, would take and it says a statement as as Desi is making some big decisions as leading at you know public education in our state. Ms. Duvall? Um, I would like, I, I agree with uh, Ms. Hennessy, and I thank you for bringing this to our attention. Um, I, I think that it's important for us to stand, for a long time, it seems like we're, we're, we're given mandates all the time. This is what you have to do, 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 do. And I think that one of the things where we're going to start to gain support is when we start to get together as far as all of us saying, we don't like this anymore. And I, so therefore, I totally support <coughs> it coming from the different school districts as a legislative, you know, move, as a political statement stating that, you know, enough's enough because it's very difficult. So many of the things that we budget are, are things that we don't have a choice over. We are told we have to budget this into it because it's a state mandate. I mean, I, I, I want to thank you very much for bringing this forth, and I full, full, full heartedly support this and support the spirit of it also. So then the plan would be to have it come, you wanted to sort of discuss it at this meeting, and then the hope would be to have a vote of some kind at a future. Okay, all right. So any other thoughts or feedback um, from other committee members? Just a question. Sure. Okay, I, I just have a couple of questions of just the details of it. Um, how did you know about this? Where was this? Um, are you part of it? Did you go? No, I'd like to go to the next meeting. No, I've been reading the superintendent of Ludlow, uh, Ludlow School's blog, and he mentioned it. And um, I, Long Meadow is a district that signed on. I work with someone who was part of it. And then my district, where I teach, um, just recently kind of brought it to their school committee and, and did it at that level. So, um, and I. Prior to this, last fall, we were at a meeting and Ms. Minnick had talked about coming together being a powerful statement to address some of these concerns. So when I saw this, I thought, well, this is a great opportunity. And so I brought it up to Dr. Provost. And the other, to follow up on that, do they have, um, is there meetings? <coughs> is there a contact number? I mean. Yep, the, there is. There's a meeting in January, tw uh, March 25th at Long Middle High School at 7, for, and they invited school committee members if they'd like to attend. And. March 25th at 7? 5th. Oh, 25th at 7th. Okay. It's the same day as the spelling bee. Yeah. Yes. For the record. Oh. So, um, and then Superintendent um, Mary O'Shea, Ham Hamden Wilbraham um, School District is also a, con a contact. But I'll read, just read the schools Agawam, the Collaborative, East Long Meadow, Hadley, Hamden Wilbraham, Long Meadow, Lower Pioneer Valley Education Collaborative, Ludlow, Monson, Palmer, Southwick, West Springfield, and uh, Chicopee are the districts that have signed on to this. Any other comments or feedback? Um, okay, so then um, sounds like then they'll just we'll put this on the agenda for next. Thank you very much. Meeting uh, for further deliberation and a vote. Okay, um, next item on the agenda is the business administrator's report. Yes, in light of the time, I'll run through this quickly. But if there's questions, I'll answer them then. So you have your regular monthly appropriation report, which is attached. 
um, there was a note that the end of year audit, which was the the assignment I had the first month I was here, the audit has been completed and it went very well. Um, the audit report will come to you when we actually receive the final document. The I don't believe I had mentioned in the past that the city council and the mayor did transfer the McKenney Vento reimbursement that had come to the city in the fall. Once free cash was certified, they did transfer those funds to us so that we can use them to pay for homeless transportation this year. So that's just under $16,000 that's been transferred over to us. The mayor's recommendations for capital funding have come out for FY16 and nine of the projects that we have requested have been recommended for funding and they're listed in the report for you. So we appreciate that. Um, and lastly, and I, more information will be coming forward on this, but there's been pretty substantial changes at the federal level on the E-rate funding, which is the money that we all pay on our phone bills every month that goes towards um, technology improvements for schools and libraries and the formula is actually the changes are actually going to be very beneficial to us and a lot of other school districts we'll lose some reimbursement on our telephone expenses but we're actually going to pick up um, far more reimbursement on infrastructure including Wi-Fi improvements so that's something that we hope to be able to piggyback on to any capital appropriations we get so that we can actually make the funds go further so as we hear more we'll be coming to you we've got applications in as we do for capital, we also have applications that Angela Roto has submitted to the, f the federal E-rate program for the Wi-Fi programs for the three elementary schools that we still need to do. So hopefully we'll get approval under the new formula. We're almost guaranteed some reimbursement now for that, those projects. Does that cover the cost of also like web hosting and web like internet and things like that? It doesn't cover internet access anymore. I'm okay. not sure about the web hosting. They're really gearing now towards the it doesn't pay for the actual computers. They're geared to the, the Wi-Fi and whatever it takes to run a Wi-Fi system in the schools and libraries now. So. Okay. No, I, just, I asked because I think it, at one point I had asked about, have, you know, the different, you know, web addresses for the school district and the city and why they had to be different. And that was one of the, one of the reasons was the E-rate versus, and so I just never quite understood that. So I'll, I'll ask Angela sometime. He can explain it to me. Um, Ms. Duvall. I have a question about the um, McKinney Vento. It does I know it's a mandate? Um, do we are we a hundred percent reimbursed for the money that we spend on transportation? No, it's depending on the state budget appropriation. So I don't know what the current. That would be lovely, but I, I'm not sure what the well, current. I'm just wondering since it's, it's a homeless transportation yeah. cost. I mean, I would think that something would be from the state. No. No, this is a federal grant that does provide some reimbursement, but it's not full reimbursement. It's actually through the state. Yeah. Um, I don't know if the federal government underwrites it. I think it might be around 50%, but I will have to check into that. Don't quote me on that. Um, our expenditures last year were down, and I think I remember when I did the report, our expenditures were in the thirty dollars to $40,000 range. So if you're a, a city and you have quite a few homeless, then it's you, it's not equitable to, well, like, it's out in the country where people aren't homeless? It's not, it's not homeless for the students that are... It's not for students that are homeless in your community attending your schools. This is transportation for a student who's homeless, who's living or attending school in another district. So they could be attending school here, become homeless, and go into residency in East Hampton. And the law requires that East Hampton and Northampton then split the cost of, of getting the student back to Northampton to attend school. So it's a 50-50 split between where the child is, is residing in a homeless situation, could be a shelter or there's a, there's a very broad definition of homeless. And this, they're entitled to come back to their school that they're familiar with so that part of their life is stable. So, so the, the two communities split the cost of transportation, and then the state reimburses part of that to us the following year okay. to the city. So it's just for the, it's, it, so we have kid A that is in our district that becomes homeless and then gets to come back to our district when is that what you're saying or yes because I, I the only thing I remember about this was something about a child um, when I was talking to the principal over at, at the building at um, where they do the homeless mostly here in Jackson Street I believe we have them in every school do we this, I thought this Jackson Street was the one that did this is this is not if we have a child who's homeless in North, who's attending school in Northampton who becomes homeless and goes into a Northampton shelter this is only for a student who crosses the city line and gets housed in our case somewhere else or it could be an East Hampton child who becomes homeless and gets placed in a shelter in Northampton it's only when the child crosses city lines 
where the two communities have to fund the transportation. This has nothing to do with the child who becomes homeless in Northampton and goes into a homeless shelter situation. The reason for this legislation on the federal level was that they wanted to give that child who became homeless some stability in their life so the family can make a choice of having their child bus back to the school that they know or they could attend school in the community that they move into in the shelter. But typically kids want to go back and stay in the school that they're familiar with. So we may have had a lot of kids from Holyoke in the past because there's a lot of shelters from, um, from there or and that's where they would have went from they were here. See, I just recall that there were kids coming in and, that, and then once it's, they came in and we had to keep them forever. It goes both ways. Moved. It's Northampton students who, who are attending school here who become homeless and move into a shelter in Holyoke or Springfield. Okay. It's also students in other communities who become homeless and end up living, and it could be with a relative. I mean, there's a very broad definition of homeless. So they could be attending school somewhere else and end up living here, hopefully on a temporary basis, and they want to go back to school in Holyoke or East Hampton. So it's a two-way street, and either case, we're responsible for 50% of the transportation, as is the other community. Okay, and until, is that until their homeless status changes? Yes. And that's something we're constantly watching to. Right, because it would seem like, I mean, do you wait till the end of the school year and there's, it's just changed? It's, it's watched on a regular basis. And they could go from one homeless residence to another homeless residence and still be homeless. Okay. And it does come from the state, but the McKinney Vento is a HUD program, federal government to the states, and then the states appropriate it okay. to all the, to all the, you know, region districts. So, um, other questions? Ms. Minnick, is that a hand? Or? No, I'm sorry. Okay. I'm massaging. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, so, any other questions? Do you, do you need to continue your report, Business Administrator? I believe that's it. Okay. Excellent. Uh, personnel report? Yeah. For the month of February, we hired three new positions that are listed there, a long-term sub, and have been able to keep adding to our list of on-call substitutes, which is an area we've been dealing with and then we had one separation. Okay. Now turn to the superintendent report. Thank you. You'll recall that the superintendent's report was replaced by the presentation of entry findings at the February agenda. So this will be sort of a catch up report covering the highlights of the events of the last 60 days. That, given the late hour, I promise it's just going to be the highlights. Uh, so. We have reached another milestone in our efforts to update the technology infrastructure within our district with the <coughs> activation of the Wi-Fi system at Leeds School. Um, installation of wireless access points continues here at JFK, and this school will be the next in line to light up its campus-wide system. Earlier this year, uh, in fact, in this very room, I attended a PAC meeting with some school committee members and heard parents and staff describe the struggles caused by the lack of a wall-to-wall Wi-Fi system at JFK. So I'm excited that we're making progress on Wi-Fi projects and that um, now we're able to focus our manpower exclusively on completing the installation at JFK. Um, as was referenced earlier, in your budget books, you'll note that the mayor's recommendation for FY16 capital improvements includes just over 150,000 for Wi-Fi installation and a clear path system that will be needed to bring Wi-Fi to our other three schools. And I believe this is an essential project and we'll work hard to bring it to completion. Um, I just want my iPad to work everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we've started with sports, so we might as well end with sports. I'd like to congratulate the 201 student athletes who participated on any of our 14 winter sports teams. Special commendations go to the girls basketball team, which ended the season in a three-way tie for the Valley League championship title. Even more importantly, all eight seniors from that team have been accepted at four-year colleges or universities. Um, the boys indoor, indoor track team distinguished itself by earning a divisional state title, second place finish at the PVIAC championships, and an overall fourth place finish in the state. Girls track team also earned a second place finish at the PVIAC championships and placed seventh at the divisional state meet. The girls swimming and diving team three-peated as West sectional champions in addition to earning the division co-champions title. We also had some notable individual achievements this winter. This winter, New school records were set by Johnny Williams in the 100-yard butterfly, 
and by Nick Whitcomb, Quinn Norton Smith, Johnny Williams, and Gabe Lyon Sosa in the 200 yard medley relay. And senior wrestler Nick Day achieved 116 career victories, taking down the previous school record of 108 victories. Also, our subcommittees have been very active over the past two months. The negotiating subcommittee met twice. The budget and property subcommittee met three times. Superintendent evaluation committee met. And in one marathon session, the rules and policy subcommittee dealt with four policies, which we plan to bring to next month's meeting. Also, uh, the PE ad hoc committee has had three meetings in the past two months. They've, they've been very productive meetings, and I feel that we're nearing a solution that will bring us into compliance with the PE requirement, um, at the same time helping us to create a more inclusive special education program at the high school. The ad hoc committee has been aware of the school committee's budget discussions, and I would expect that the final proposal will come in at a much more modest cost than was originally projected. However, I think I'd be remiss if I failed to mention that this entire process has shown a, shot, a spotlight on the status of the comprehensive health education system at our high school. Um, to provide some context, our high school serves about twice as many students as East Hampton High, but we have essentially the same number of physical edu education teachers as they have in East Hampton. Um, I know there's a sincere concern for supporting the health of our high school students, and what's become clear to me through this process is that confronting the issues inherent in our current understaffing of physical education teachers must be part of the process of enhancing physical well-being of our high school students. Um, nevertheless, um, I do think that the proposals we've been developing will markedly improve our health education program, and I'm looking forward to bringing them to the school committee at a future date. And finally, uh, I'd like to mention some important upcoming dates. Um, I believe that the debut of Godspell is probably over now, <laughs> but we have additional performances taking place tomorrow night and Saturday night at 7 p.m. There will also be a Saturday matinee at 2 o'clock. As was mentioned earlier, the NEF Spelling Bee will take place March 25th at 6 p.m. at JFK Middle School. And on a somewhat more weighty note, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education's on-site program coordinator program review will take place from March 30th through April 3rd. Any member of the public wishing to be interviewed by a member of the department's visiting team should contact my office. We've received a few inquiries already, and I know that um, it's very helpful when Jesse staff gets to talk to parents. That's my report. Okay. Okay. Um, do we have any new business? Okay, no new business. I just will uh, let the public know future business and meeting dates. We have a business, budget and property subcommittee meeting on March 19th at 3.30 p.m. in the superintendent's office. And then, of course, our next school committee meeting will be March 26th, 7.15 p.m. here in the JFK Community Room. Um, and now I would like to request um, that someone make a motion uh, that we move into an executive session in the JFK Principals Conference Room. Um, and the motion is uh, spelled out in quite detail here. So I would ask uh, um. someone to, um, to make that motion if they would. <laughs> Sorry, I wasn't prepared for that. Looking at me. It's on the agenda. I have to pull it up. Hold on one second. Uh, I move that we uh, that the school committee go into executive session under Massachusetts general law open meeting for the approval of executive session minutes and um, of January 22nd, January 29th, and March 5th, 2015, and Chapter 30A, Section 21A3 to discuss strategy with respect to litigation civil action number. 14-30113-MGM, whereas an open session would have a detrimental effect and further details would further compromise the reasons for going into executive session. Second. Okay. So I, on this, I need to ask for a roll call vote. Move Laura Fallon. Yes. Is yes. Thank yes you. Yes. Not an I, a yes. Yes. <laughs> Got it. Um, yes. 
Yes. All right. <laughs> yes. 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 So the motion carries. I do need to announce to the public that we will now be moving into executive session because to hold uh, this uh, portion of the meeting in open session uh, would be detrimental to the uh, city's uh, bargaining position under Chapter 30, in accordance with Chapter 30A. I also have to let the public know that we will adjourn directly from the meeting. We will not return. We will adjourn. So we'll now move into executive session. 